This episode of Recording Studio Rockstars is brought to you by OWC, Spectra 1964, Sampley, Isotope, Sonarworks, and API. In fact, you're hearing my voice right now on the Spectra 1964 STX100 mic pre in an API lunchbox mixed carefully through Isotope RX and Ozone, all recorded safely onto an OWC SSD. So get ready to rock. I have rebuilt myself many times, many times. You know, it's uh, especially in building my little audio business. Uh, there were many months that went by where I really didn't do a whole lot physically. And so I had to rebuild. I had to kind of take a bunch of steps back, but it's okay. You know, it's once it becomes a lifestyle for you, you'll worry less about where you are. And, and like I said, you'll, you'll be more engaged with just doing the process. Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is the podcast created to help you become a rock star of the recording studio. The API Select T25 is a classic two-channel FET feedback style compressor limiter with a Class A tube output stage and custom API transformer, allowing split mono or stereo mode. Built with dual triode vacuum tubes, sidechain de-essing, detent controls for accurate recall, and API's famous thrust mode, the T25 represents a new design in tube compression. Bring the legendary sound of API to your home studio studio with the new Select T25 at apiaudio.com. You've already invested in your speakers, headphones, and the sound treatment of your studio. So you're ready to make great music, but your mixes don't seem to translate to the rest of the world when they leave the studio. The problem is that the frequency response of your room is not allowing your speakers to tell you the whole story. Sonarworks Sound ID Reference can solve this for you by calibrating your speakers and headphones EQ and balance so that you can now make better mix choices. Start with a 21 day free trial at sonarworks.com. Howdy, Rockstars. It's your host, Lid Shaw, and welcome back to Recording Studio Rockstars, bringing you into the studio to learn from recording professionals so that you can make your best record ever and be a rock star of the studio yourself. My guest today is Trent Jones, a podcast producer, editor, and composer based in Chattanooga, Tennessee. He's produced over 1,000 podcast episodes in a wide variety of formats and topics, as well as a number of audiobooks. Trent is also a strength and conditioning coach with a specialty in training men and women over 40 using barbells, resistance training, and high-intensity interval training. And Rockstars, as you know, I'm, I'm particularly interested in health and exercise and stuff like that, so I'm excited to integrate this topic as well. After years of working, quote, working out in public gyms and seeing little progress, Trent discovered the starting strength method in 2016 and began training under a starting strength coach. He gained 40 pounds of muscular body weight over a year and greatly improved his strength, joint health, and mental health in the process. And I'm going to throw in there um, that you probably saw a, an improvement in your, your ability to work in the studio as well. Trent currently coaches online and in person out of his home gym, and he co-hosts two podcasts about health and fitness called Weights and Plates and 40 Fit Radio, and also a music podcast called Music and Ideas. Uh, and there may be others too, Trent, which you can, you can uh, remind us about here in a minute. I'm super psyched to have Trent here on the podcast today. Um, I had the pleasure of having Trent come up and, and visit me in Nashville too and see the studio. So we got to um, shoot the shit a little bit before this episode. And Trent also brought really good coffee for the studio. So thanks for that, dude. Please welcome Trent Jones to Recording Studio Rockstars. Trent, are you ready to rock, dude? I'm ready to rock. Thanks, man. Thanks for being here. And, um, you know, it's great to hang out with you, man. It's been really cool meeting you and uh, yeah. connecting with you. Yeah, yeah. Well, th well, thanks so much for having me on, Lidge. I, I really appreciate it. I, I kind of feel like Wayne and Garth right now. Like, I'm not <laughs> so worthy. I'm not worthy. <laughs> Yeah, that's, I've been listening to your show for the last couple of years, and uh, man, like a lot of the people that have made like some of my favorite records have been on your show. So I feel like I shouldn't be here, but I'm nevertheless very honored and excited. 
Well, dude, it's great to have you here. And and I have <laughs> felt very fortunate to have a lot of guests on this show that uh, I feel the I'm not worthy about as well. So I'm familiar with that. You know, one funny thing about having you on the show, having listened to your stuff and then just hearing your voice now is, dude, you've got such a podcast voice, man. You've really, you've really got that thing, you know? Oh, really? You think so? I think so. Yeah. You just, you have that. <laughs> there's something about it that has that clarity and confidence and there's a calmness to your you know, you're enthusiastic, but kind of chill about it at the same time. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's funny. I, I guess, you know, everyone that has a higher pitched or, or lighter timbred voice probably feels this way. But, you know, I always felt like I couldn't do like voiceover or narration just because I didn't sound like James Earl Jones. Yeah, I know what you mean, <laughs> man. <laughs> right. Like I always I listen to myself and I guess we all do that. Right. It's like if you ever try to record yourself singing the first time you hear yourself back, you're like, oh, my God, no way. That's not me. Yeah, totally. In fact, uh, we used to have cassette tape answering machines back in the day. And I remember that was the first time in my growing up that everybody all of a sudden had to record their own voice and then hear it back, knowing that that voice was going to go out and broadcast to every single phone call that came in and didn't get answered. And boy, it was just hilarious watching like my dad, for example, or even myself, just just recording my voice and then hearing back going like, what? That's I don't sound like that, man. Give me a break. That's ridiculous. Right. Oh, it's it's so stressful, you know, figuring out what you're going to say in your voicemail. I mean, I, I, do, I do probably like six or seven takes whenever I have to update it on the phone. You update your voicemail? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I was kind of forced to. I switched phone plans a while back and, and I realized after a while that my, my mailbox wasn't working. So uh, mm, but yeah, I yeah. switched it, phone plans a while ago. I wonder if mine's not working. I need yeah, to check it. Check it out. Check it oh out. Oh my goodness! Sorry, I mean, Rockstars, although who, if you've been who calling a, me, who leaves a message anymore? I know. And as soon really, as I get the you know. the answering machine, I just hang up. I go over yeah. to the text, and then I send a voice <laughs> right. voice memo through text. <laughs> uh, um, well, awesome, dude. Well, so tell us a little bit more about who you are. Um, you know, obviously, the intro reading that it sounds pretty focused on the the health and strength training aspect, which is great. And I want to talk about that stuff. But this being a recording studio podcast, we need to be reminded of how this all um, connects together for you. You know, you started out, had some sort of interest in music and have found yourself in a place where you're producing podcasts, producing music for podcasts, and also still pursuing your passion of training and strength training. Yeah, well, you know, I've had kind of a funny ride into the audio world. Um, yeah, like you mentioned, I, like many people, got into recording and mixing and just audio production in general because I was a musician. I started playing guitar when I was 11. And, uh, you know, I played in bands in high school. Uh, I used to play coffee shop gigs in college. And I always had an interesting interest in playing and songwriting. But especially in college, I really got into just the, the whole idea of like production behind a record. And uh, I just always was just captivated by the sounds of things as much as I was the music. Mm -hmm. And um, I think a big part of that came from, you know, I, I would kind of cut my teeth growing up on like 90s rock, you know, like the whole grunge era and, and alternative rock. And uh, I kind of walked backwards from that back to the stuff that inspired it in the, in the 70s and the 80s. But there was this like, is this interesting time period where, you know, musical technology was just every decade seemed to be taking these huge leaps. And, you know, music production and the creativity that went into the, the production process, you know, kind of, kind of separate or alongside the music um, was, was making all of these innovations and leaps. And so I was just captiv captivated by that. And um, I, I always wanted to get into recording and mixing and just any sort of audio production I could, but I didn't take that route when I went to college. But um, you were I playing. Actually, Meanwhile, you were playing that's right. guitar yeah, I've been, and being in a band and stuff. Right, right. So I've, I've been playing all the way through and writing songs and recording myself. Um, but, you know, I went to college and I ended up getting an English degree and I kind of freaked out halfway through that and got a business degree too. Um, nice. <laughs> and so I ended up when I graduated from, uh, from Texas, I, I moved up to Connecticut and I started working, you know, in the corporate world in, uh, in finance. And uh, oh, wow. I, I'm, I'm still not quite sure how I ended up there, to be honest, but um, I did that for about five or six years, um, ended up moving back to Texas where I, where I grew up and 
you know, I fell into the strength training world at the same time that I made that move from Connecticut back to Texas. And as I was working the corporate world, and I was, as I was really clearly not fitting into that world, you know, it just didn't fit my skill set, didn't fit my personality. And I knew I needed to make a change, but I didn't know, I didn't know where to go. And I, I didn't really feel that audio was a viable career for me. And I, I really didn't have any mentors and I wasn't around, you know, people who did this professionally. Right. Um, it was just an intense passion that I kept up, you know, along the way. And so, you know, it just, the stars kind of aligned for me. I got into strength training. Um, like you mentioned in the intro, I, I learned about starting strength. I found a starting strength coach in my area that, that started coaching me and training me. And I started making all of this progress in my physical life that started to bleed over into my work life. And I started, you know, kind of sticking up for myself a little bit more at work and uh, deciding like, hey, you know, what? I'm going to take the reins and do something that, that actually fits, you know, my personality and my strengths. And I'm, I'm going to go find this. I'm going to go carve it out and, and carve out a new career path. Mm-hmm. Well, it just so happens that along the way, some, some fellow starting strength coaches started a podcast called Barbell Logic. Right. And uh, Barbell Logic, uh, you know, at the time was, was basically the only strength training podcast that was really talking about training in the way that starting strength talks about training. And we'll, we'll talk more about that later, what that means and what starting strength is. And uh, these guys had great content and their audio was terrible. Mm-hmm. You mean so, like just the voice recording itself even? Oh yeah. The recording's terrible. There's tons of echo in the room. You know, they were using these, uh, these like cheap condensers that, you know, they were, you know, two inches away from. So there's just like bloated proximity effect and like just this cacophony of echoes in the room yeah, they were yeah. in. It was just a mess. And, uh, and I, I, I love these guys. They're friends. So I can, I can say that, but, uh, I basically emailed them and I was like, Hey guys, I love your content. I think you could use a little bit of help with your audio and I would love to help you out. Nice, man. I thought and, and, that before with <laughs> some of my favorite podcasts. I'll listen. I'm like, good Lord, is nobody, do they have nobody on the audio team for this show? You know? Uh, right, right. And may, maybe not. And I, my, my whole thing was like, you know, I just, I love their content so much. I want it to be something that people are going to listen to and engage with. And, yeah. you know, if, if there's a huge barrier just because of sound quality, it makes it, makes it hard. So uh, they were like, oh, hey, thanks for the tips. And then a couple of weeks later, they called me and they said, hey, do you just want to produce our show? And of course I said yes. Nice. And that basically got me started down the road of becoming a podcast producer. You know, I had no idea what I was doing. Um, I just had some basic audio skills from just years of recording myself and from reading and listening to podcasts. And, you know, just, just kind of digging into, uh, how record production, you know, happened. So when uh, you but, say recording yourself, you mean you were recording yourself musically as it like home musically. studio music stuff. So you, you knew what it was like to be on a microphone and get a good vocal sound and that sort of thing. That's right. Yeah. So I, I knew the basics of like, you know, the, the, the intas and the outas, you know, and how to hook everything up and get decent gain staging. Right. Well, it's funny because I, I I think that's a common thought probably with people. I felt the same way. I was like, when I heard other podcasts and I heard a lot of bad ones too, and then I thought about getting into it myself, I was like, oh man, I can do this thing. I, I know how to record and how to make something sound good. Um, funny enough, I discovered that there was still a pretty good learning curve ahead of me as far as you know trying to figure out how to get a podcast to sound great or sound the way I wanted it to, or some of the challenges, um, in the same way that mixing music can sometimes keep you going back to do a remix, you know? Right, right. Yeah. That, and that's definitely something I've learned over the years is, you know, what makes a podcast sound good and what makes it translate. And it's different from, it's different from music. You know, it's not a, it's not a pop mix. If you make your voice sound like a pop vocal, uh, you're in for a, a, you know, a painful ride, I think, as a listener. Yeah, it'd be hard to listen to a Katy Perry pop vocal for 45 minutes. If it's just too much excitement and, and, and energy in there. Yeah, just too bright, too yeah. saturated, too, too, too whatever. Yeah. yeah. Well, so let's see here. Um, why don't you start by telling us what you're on right now? Because you're recording your voice. Are you using the same thing you would typically use to do your own podcast? Or is this any different? 
Yeah, no, this is my typical vocal chain. It's very simple. Um, I like the Electro Voice RE20. That's what I'm talking into right now. And uh, I'm running through um, this kind of, I got this really cool mic pre. It's called a Bonneville 990. And as far as I know, it's the only one that exists. Okay. And is it um, like a solid state or some kind of unusual tube thing or something? Yeah. It's is a, it an it's old a, car? It sounds like an old car. <laughs> yeah, it does sound like an old car. Yeah, I, I don't honestly know a whole lot about the history of this thing, but it, it's a custom-built mic pre that a guy named Ned Clayton put together. And the, the story I was told is that he basically, Bonneville is a company owned by the Mormon church, so the, the LDS church. And I guess in the 70s and 80s, they started buying up radio stations and TV stations, and they rolled them all up under this entity called Bonneville. And hmm. I, Bonneville had like an in-house engineering team that designed a lot of the equipment that went into their radio stations. And one of the units that they produced, they actually also offered commercially. Wow, I, that's I think a this great is back story. in the early 80s. And it was like a line distribution amplifier or something like that. But at any rate, somehow this guy, this guy uh, Ned Clayton, got a hold of a bunch of these and he rebuilt them into mic pre's. And um, it's kind of similar in topology to like the John Hardy M1. Right, um, right. Clean, but also, you know, warm and friendly sounding. Yeah, it's kind of got a, a everything sounds just a little bigger than life, but it's not, it's not uh, obviously saturated or, you know, it's, it's not kind of Im imparting a lot of color to the signal. It's everything just kind of gets bigger, uh, very high headroom. But uh, yeah, there's just basically just stuffed full of really good parts. You know, it's built around a, a John Hardy 990 op amp. Um, it's got a little bit different input and output transformers than the actual M1 preamp. So I don't know how similar it sounds because I've never had a, an M1. But yeah, it's a cool little, it's kind of my secret weapon. And um, hopefully he's going to build me some more of them. Nice. Well, I don't know if John Hardy was building his mic pre's based on the kind of standard Jensen transformer circuit designs. but I. But I do remember discovering that world at one point where like Jensen, who made the Transformers, also made all these different circuit designs publicly available. Like, here's how you make a mic pre. Here's how you do this. Here's how you use our stuff to build your own gear. And, um, and I remember that, that uh, I think it was Sunset Sound Studio C, the Prince Room, they had designed their console and all the, all the um, Sunset Sound mic pre's for that based on this basic Jensen transformer circuit design. And I don't know where I'm going with this other than that's, that's just, just really fun to me. I love hearing about all these different stories and different cool, traditional mic pre designs. Your voice right, sounds yeah. great, man. Sounds great. Well, well, thank you. Thank you. But, uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. So it's just uh, Mike that, that preamp, and then I'm running into my interface. Cool. Um, and dynamic mic, how often do you feel like a condenser mic is a good choice for a podcast? Uh, rarely, rarely, but that said, there are some excellent sounding podcasts that use condensers. Uh, the one that comes to mind, that's one of my favorites. I think it's kind of a gold standard for quality is criminal by uh, Phoebe judge. Okay. I don't know that one. It's a, it's a true crime podcast, which I, I'm not, I'm not super into true crime myself, but I do like that show. I, I just, I love the way I think their storytelling is just great the way they put their shows together. But yeah, Phoebe Judge is the host, and uh, she just has a wonderful, like, librarian kind of voice. Nice. You know? Like, shh. Yeah, she just has a really <laughs> quiet, like, uh, I, I don't even know where her accent's from, but it's it's great. And I'm pretty sure she uses a TLM uh, 103, you know, the, the Neumann. Interesting. And, uh, I wonder if that, it's because of just her soft voice. Maybe it sort of enhances it or brings more out with, with that. I, I've I've been surprised by that difference. Like sometimes I'll use a condenser. Um, like I use um, some great condensers for my ads. I've been using the uh, Jay-Z BB29. I've been using, um, you know, a variety of mics from them actually to create ads at the beginning of the show. And they sound great. I love them. But then I'm also always struck by how for podcasting, this is just a dynamic mic that I use. It's the um, Mic Tech uh, PM9, and I've used it for every show, and I and I can often be struck by like, man, a dynamic just is, sounds great. It's easy to make it sound sort of big and warm, and maybe yeah. it's that thing you said where it's 
it's not trying to hit you over the head with, um, you know, uh, um, a brightness and clarity the whole time. Right, right. You know, one of the other kind of gold standards for me in, is an audiobook, actually. And it's the Harry Potter series read by Jim Dale. Okay. And the performance is wonderful. I mean, he voices all of the characters, uh, which is amazing because there's just hundreds of characters in that in the book series. But I just, I, I love his voice and the way that it translates. It's just, it seems to never bug me. Like I can listen to it for three hours in the car and it's clear, it's detailed, but it's never harsh. It's never fatiguing. And um, I, I, you know, I don't know how they recorded that audiobook, but I've seen some pictures of Jim Dale in the studio and, you know, he's got a U87 usually in front of him, but it's got a pop filter on it, sometimes a double pop filter. And then sometimes they use a windscreen on top of that. Wow. <laughs> so it's kind of funny. So they use this, you know, super detailed condenser, but they're also like kind of trying to kill some of that top end a little right, bit. Right, right. Um, and make the microphone disappear. So I think, yeah, I think for most people, a dynamic mic just kind of does that by nature uh, of the, the design. And, you know, the other thing is I, I've recorded a few audiobooks, um, none of them in like a professional environment. You know, they were all kind of on location at the, at the client's office or, you know, whatever we could rig up. And it is devilishly hard to... Devilishly. <laughs> it, it, it's so hard to get rid of all the reflections in a room and you hear every single one of them when you're recording an audiobook. Um, it's stuff yeah. that you would never even think about when you're, if you're recording a vocal that's going to go into a mix. Um, it's just going to get covered up with, you know, with reverb and, and just the rest of the arrangement. But uh, yeah, some of the stuff that you pick up in an audiobook recording is just like, really? <laughs> so I think a dynamic mic is best for most people because if you pick the right mic for your voice, you can get a great capture. You can get a lot of detail, um, a lot more detail than you probably realize. And at the same time, you're, it, it, it's naturally going to ignore a lot of the room reflections that would be a problem if you had a, a super sensitive condenser mic. Yeah. I mean, um, you know, the Shure SM7 is a classic mic for podcasting and radio and YouTube videos and stuff like that. It's also a classic mic for recording music in the studio. What are some things about, you know, recording a podcast voice with a dynamic mic that you have found translate well for a studio recording? Yeah. So my big thing when I, I coach my, my clients, um, because they're, they're typically recording their podcast on their own. You know, I, I help them buy a setup and they'll record on their own and then send me the raw audio to just to, to edit and mix up to the finished product and I'll post it for them. Mm -hmm. But they're doing the recording themselves. So they need to, they need to understand how to, how to do this. And the big thing I tell them is that um, you want to be close to the mic. And that's, again, this is the same idea of we're trying to get rid of as much of the room as we can, because for a lot of people, room treatment is not an option. You know, I, I try to when yeah. I can, if, if, I've got, if I've got clients that are always going to be recording in the same place to get some room treatment and at least kill some of the flutter echo in their room. But, you know, some guys are recording on, the, on location and they're always traveling. So it's, it's just not, uh, it's not feasible. So... I, t I tell them to work the mic close. You know, right now I'm probably, you know, two, three inches from the mic. Yeah, that's about where I am too. And, and it's mine sort of coming, it's sort of miking the side corner of my mouth, not right in front of me. Exactly. Yeah. And that's, that's the other thing I was going to say is that you want to, you want to point the mic, you know, I have it mm, maybe about 30 degrees angled. So if you think about 90 degrees being like perfectly centered on my mouth. So splay it out about 30 degrees away from your mouth and then point it at the corner of your mouth so that the mic is still picking up your voice, but you're not talking into the mic. And that is going to help you avoid plosives. Yeah. Uh, it's also, also tends to help you avoid like the, you know, the, you know, the lip smacky stuff. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. In my studio, I've got the Mac Mini M1 paired up with the OWC Mini Stack STX Thunderbolt 4 Certified Storage and Hub Expansion Solution to connect to all my dedicated audio drives, sample libraries, and backup drives. It's the perfect size to stack with the Mac Mini and add storage and connectivity over Thunderbolt or USB. Whether you have the new or older Mac Mini, nothing stacks up in your studio quite like OWC. Find the new Mini Stack STX and all your storage needs 
at maxsales.com slash rockstars. The Spectra 1964 C610 comp limiter brings fast, clean, quiet compression and limiting to your recordings and mixes. The C610 includes the famous Spectra 101 amplifier used in legendary studios like Stax, Arden, and Record Plant. I love using my C610s for drums, vocals, guitars, and especially bass, which now sounds bigger than anything I've ever recorded before. Make your mixes rock at spectra1964.com. Well, and that's the thing about condenser mics is they really pick up the lip smacky stuff. Yeah. And I think it can, you you run the risk of it requiring you to do a whole lot more work on cleanup and stuff like that. Exactly. Which yeah. maybe that's something that we should dive into too. The difference between choices you would make to treat a voice, you know, on a podcast versus choices you would make to treat a voice in a music mix. So for example, if you're doing a typical pop song, you're talking about three and a half minutes. It's not even three and a half minutes of singing. It's like a, a collection of verse phrases, a collection of chorus phrases. You know, you got some other vocals in there. And it can take a while to go through and really, you know, with a with a magnifying uh, glass, address every single little detail. But it's not overwhelming like you can get through it and you know you got to get this one song right so it can be worth it to go and manually draw out little different pops and clicks and carve each breath perfectly and everything but good lord if you tried to do that in a two-hour podcast i'd still be mixing my first episode for, for recording <laughs> studio rock stars you know right right yeah and then when you get you know if you're going to try to do this for a living you know right now i'm producing seven shows and so it's just it's a lot of content every week that's coming out um, so yeah, you got to be able to work fast and, and yeah, it's like anything, right? The golden rule of audio is like, get it right at the source as much as you can. Right. But there are some things that you just, you not, you can't really change. You can't change people's way of doing, of, of essing and, and having sibilants and, and fricatives and consonants and all that kind of stuff in their voice. Cause you just want people to relax and, and have a normal conversation. But, yeah. um, so then like things like breaths, things like S's, those are the kind of things that that I find myself like heavily relying on um, you know, the mix tricks and plugins to try and hit a sweet spot and dial it down. Like I'm yes. not gonna go in and manually DS my voice. <laughs> right, <laughs> ever right. if I can help it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And so that that's where, you know, the right microphone pairing can really help. Uh, if you can, you know, trying at least two or three different dynamic mics on your voice, if you're going to, if you're going to do this podcasting thing, or if you're working with someone else can really help. You know, I have an SM7 here in the drawer that I use on, I actually use it on my wife. She's, uh, she's, she sounds great on that. I sound terrible. It's just like a honky mess on my mm. voice. And uh, it tends to work really well in most voices, but when it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Uh, I find the RE20 tends to work when the SM7 doesn't. And so if you can at least try those two mics, uh, you're probably going to have a good chance of, of success. But I've had, uh, I've had success with some other ones, like uh, the Heil PR40 can be great on some yeah. voices. It's much more hit and miss to me, but it's, um, when it's great, it's, it's got a lot of clarity and it almost sounds condenser-like. That is one uh, that that uh, I heard about through Pat Flynn and John Lee Dumas, a couple of business podcasters. They really swore swore by it, and then I remember trying it out myself, and I was like, I don't like this mic, you know, because <laughs> yeah, it just I think it just wasn't right for my voice. It's got a big presence peak at five k, and so if you have a sibil if your sibilance lives in that range, it's just it's just not going to work. Um, yeah, I, I had a client who had uh, PR forties, and we yeah we had struggled a lot with sibilance. And it's funny, you know, this is one of those things where you're talking about mixed tricks can help you, but you know, it was one of those things where on this guy's voice, just, it was a, it was a combination of the reflections in the room, amplifying the, the sibilance, you know, his, his natural sibilance in his voice and that mic. I mean, I could hammer this thing with two DSers doing 10 to 20 dB of, of, um, gain reduction at times. Wow. And multi-band, you know, like dynamic EQ, trying to duck down some of the sibilant frequencies. And it's still like you're always riding that wave of like, well, 
if I if I hit it hard enough with the DSers and the multiband stuff to to tame it, then it starts to it almost gets worse because you've, you're compressing the S so much at that right, point. Right, it stands out. And so if you back it off to where it sounds more natural, then it starts to cut. And and it's one of those things where on cheap car speakers, like I have a I have a a car that I check my podcast in sometimes because the speakers sound terrible, <laughs> and they just have this like massive you know, just upper mid range spike that tends to make things sound harsh. So if it sounds okay on that, then I know I'm, I'm okay. Um, yeah, that's an interesting thing. It's that whole conundrum of like, which speaker do we check for podcasts? Cause I do feel like it's a little different than music. Right. Right. And, uh, and so, you know, the solution in that case for that client was just to get a different mic because, and, and even then I'm still doing a fair amount of work in the mix to DS his voice, but it's much more natural now because the mic is not emphasizing that, that range. So, yeah. you know, those are easy things you can play with. And, and, um, you know, once you find a good match, it's, uh, the less work you have to do in the mix, usually the better it's going to turn out for when we're yeah. talking about spoken word. Yeah. And when you say spoken word, you're, you, you're referring to podcasts and audiobooks. Yeah. Anything, even voiceover, same thing, you know, the closer, I mean, I suppose this is what we're always trying to do, even when we're recording music, but there's something about the human voice, I think because we're used to hearing it all the time, that the humans are very sensitive to artifacts from processing on the human voice. Right, right. Because it's and, changing something that would normally sound natural to us. It starts to, we recognize it as unnatural. You can change exactly. the shit out of an electric guitar and it just sounds like a cool effect on the electric guitar. <laughs> right. And, and even sung vocals to an extent, you know, you can double things, you can throw a chorus on it, you can compress it. You can oh my God, let's start it. doubling podcasts. <laughs> that would be amazing. <laughs> I'd be impressed if somebody could do that. I'd like to hear that. All right, ready? On the count of three, we'll say, let's start doubling podcasts. One, two, three. Let's start, let's start doubling, doubling podcasts. Podcast. Oh, man, Skype yeah. and the delay latency. God yeah. damn it, it never is going to work. <laughs> we, we had no chance. We had no chance. All right. Um, very cool. So much cool stuff to talk about. Let's let's go to the, the big question in the room, the big elephant-like question. Um, why, you know, if we love doing music and we love doing studio, why do we give a shit about things like podcasts and audiobooks? Well, that's a great question. Um, you know, I'm coming at this from the point of starting in the podcast world and branching out into music professionally. Um, although, like I said, I, I have been a musician my, my whole life. Um, but one thing I do like about the, the world of podcasts is that I have a small stable of clients and it's regular work. Right. So, it's a lot faster than waiting on the band to make their next record. That's right. You know, and, and I, I have less, I, I don't need to spend as much time chasing down the next project because I know I have X number of shows coming out each week for, you know, for the foreseeable future. And, uh, you know, not every show is going to last forever, obviously, but it's, it's pretty reliable work and it's pretty steady. So you can plan around it. And if you, it also, it leaves a lot of space to optimize your workflow. So if you can get really fast with your editing, if you can figure out a good mix template that, that kind of gets you to 80, 90% there um, very quickly, then you can, you can take on a pretty good stable of work and build yourself a, a base income to, so you don't have to worry about paying the bills. Right. And then you have, the, you have some flexibility and some freedom with the rest of your time to do, take on the more creative projects, which might, you know, they might take more time. It, they may be sporadic. Um, and so that, that's, that's why I've enjoyed working on podcasts. Yeah. And, and, um, you know, you've also done a really cool thing, which is you've spun the music around into this other thing. So you're creating music for podcasts. Um, and I, you know, I suppose that again, like you said, at the beginning of this, you just sort of invented your own new career, which is a great way to look at things. Cause Somebody, you know, if you're making one song for an intro of a podcast and then that's the same song that's used in all of them, kind of like mine keeps reusing the same collection of music, then then you might beg the question, oh, well, what if I want to make more music than that? There's no rule that says, you you know, some of us can't just design a scenario where there's a different recording of music made all the time for podcasts. I think one of them that you said you maybe didn't make the music for is the um, You Need a Budget podcast that you're editing. And it sounds That's like right. they yeah. maybe switch out the music all the time. 
Oh, yeah, actually. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. So the the main theme for You Need a Budget is uh, it's stock music that they picked years ago. That show's been going on for, I think, seven years. Oh, wow. And I started working on it, uh, gosh, about 18 months ago, two years ago. And so I've done the last couple hundred episodes. But before that, they, you know, they've been going for a while before me. Um, so the main theme was already there. And we've kept that for most of the shows. But we've kind of created some sub topics within that show. And I wrote the themes for those. So if you listen to the You Need a Budget podcast and you see the Money Stories podcasts, those are stories about YNAB users. Um, YNAB is what they abbreviate right. the name of the company. Yeah. So YNAB software users that have done something remarkable, like pay off a bunch of debt or you know, uh, start a business or something. The music for that, those episodes, I, I did. That's and cool. then the same thing with, uh, we did a series a while back where the owner of the company interviewed all of the employees at, at YNAB and we kind of, you know, kind of did a smorgasbord of interviews and kind of experience from the inside, right? How these people manage their money. And, uh, I did the music, the kind of interstitial music for that too. That's cool, man. Well, let's talk a little bit about how you're doing that music. Um, I know each of us might have a different strength in music and we may have different studio setups, uh, you are recording stuff that I would describe as sounding kind of like a band, but it sounds like you're also like guitar is your, that's your instrument, but you've also got drums and bass in there and stuff like that. Are you right. recording real drums or have you found a, a good way to use samples and things like that in your production? Yeah, I wish I could record real drums. Um, you know, I can't play them myself and uh, I usually don't have the budget to hire somebody. So I'm doing it all in the box. Um, I, cool. I've been using uh, Slate, Stephen Slate 5. I think they're on now, 5.5 now. And uh, yeah, it's been great. I've, it took me a while to figure out how to make it sound natural, or at least I hope it's, it comes across as sounding like it, it was played by a, a real player. Um, yeah. But I think, you know, nowadays at least um, with Stephen Slate, and I've, I've heard Superior Drummer is great. I know a lot of people talk, uh, talk highly about that program. Um, if you go and 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 you you kind of grab the raw, unprocessed samples in those packages and you do the mixing yourself like you would a real kit, um, then I find you can get a pretty natural sounding result. And uh, yeah, that's kind of how I think is, you know, how a band would play music. And um, I'll usually start on the guitar, come up with an idea, r record a scratch track to a click, and then start figuring out what kind of rhythm it needs. And then I'll, I'll, I'll lay down drums in, uh, in MIDI. And again, I'm usually working off like pre-programmed uh, like uh, grooves, MIDI grooves. Right. They come with the program. You just can select different verse and chorus grooves and that kind of thing. Yeah, that's right. So they, it comes, Stephen Slate comes with a bunch of, of preloaded MIDI grooves. And the important thing here is they were all tracked by a real player. So, right. you know, I guess they just put triggers on and, and figured out a clever way to to capture the velocities in a realistic way. And, uh, and you can buy others too. I've got a handful of grooves from uh, Groove Monkey. It's, a, it's okay. a great website and they've got thousands of them. And again, they're, they're not quantized. They're, they're entirely played by session drummers. So um, what I'm looking for there is, is I'll basically try to find parts of grooves that have the right, you know, that, that have the stuff that I find I have trouble programming from scratch. Right. So if we're talking about like a, a basic, you know, rock beat, you know, with a, a back beat and the two and the four, it's pretty easy to move kicks and snares around and, and, and to have them sound pretty natural and get the pattern you want. Mm -hmm. um, I find hi-hats are very difficult to program from scratch. Right. They don't sound real if they're yeah, all Yeah, you get that. <laughs> yeah, it gets perfectly. drum machine sounding. Yeah, it's way too fast. And so uh, what I found is, is I'll try to find a groove that has the right hi-hat pattern or, or that's very close. And I'll, I'll take that and I might scrap everything else except the, the hi-hat track. And then I'll go in and I might find another groove that has the, the kick and snare pattern I want and then just kind of glom them onto each other and then start, start moving it around. Um, but yeah, I'm looking for that feel first that's got the right velocity and, uh, and, and timing that I want. And then I can, you know, I can, I can kind of build the rest of the track around it. Okay, cool. So then what do you use for the tool for constructing all this music? Are you in Pro Tools or Logic or something else? Yeah, so I'm, I'm the weird guy. I use uh, Reaper. Oh, nice, man. All right, cool. <laughs> Tell us about Reaper. 
Yeah, well, I love it. Uh, it's I've been using it for, gosh, I think about eight nine years. Uh, I, I started using it. Um, well, I guess I started using it in college, so you know, even even longer than that, about uh, eleven years ago. But uh, yeah, it's a cool program. It's it's a pretty full featured DAW. Um, they're on Reaper six now, I believe. Digital on- audio workstation, Rockstars. Digital audio workstation. Yeah, that's right. Uh, so yeah, they're on version six right now, I believe. I'm on version five still, just because I've I've got a lot of things I need to upgrade first, and you know, I kind of like to do that all when I have a time to, um, you know, to fix to troubleshoot problems. Yeah. But but you know, I think by now they've they've pretty much caught up with most of the other major uh, DAWs in features. Um, what I like about Reaper is it's it's very configurable. So you know, I use a custom theme. That that you know changes the colors of the tracks and the basic user interface makes everything look um, like a barbell. And whenever you click with the mouse, it it does like a <laughs> grunt lifting sound. Oh man, I needed to des- to design that theme. <laughs> it doesn't, but I, I need that now. There you go. Um, but yeah, so so Reaper's got this this very uh, rich community of people that have developed their own user interfaces for it, and it's as simple as you can download. You can view them all on the Reaper website. And you can download whatever you want and just drop it into the program and then see if you like it. And so I, you know, years ago, I cycled through a bunch of themes because the stock, to me, the stock user interface, the stock GUI on Reaper, Reaper is kind of, uh, it's pretty utilitarian looking and it's not very inspiring to look at. Rockstar's GUI, graphical user interface. Yeah. I'm yeah, the translator right. for I'm just today. dropping all the lingo <laughs> over here. No, my bad. Uh, And uh, so anyway, I found a theme that I like that's very easy on the eyes. You know, I can look at it for nine hours a day and and my retinas aren't, you know, don't feel torched. And and so, yeah, so that's why I like Reaper. It's very configurable. And you can do the same thing with with um, the routing, with uh, the track layout. I mean, it's it's extremely flexible, which is its strength and maybe also its weakness. Well, that's what I remember noticing about Reaper when I explored it um, years ago is that it seemed like it it had a lot of flexibility. You could send something to something else pretty easily. But also, it also seemed like you really didn't really needed to know your how to navigate your way around all the menus and the choices and the little checkboxes to click to make everything set up just right. Does it yeah, still feel yeah. that way to you or now? Or is it has that changed? Or is it more like you've just figured out what your sort of static setup is? For, for using it in your studio. And once that's settled in, you don't think about it anymore. Yeah. I mean, I, I have a template now for both music and for, for, for composing and for podcasts that is pretty, you know, of course things change in it from time to time, but it's pretty much set up with the routing that I want. Um, but yeah, I think the thing that has changed in the last few years with Reaper is there is some amazing resources on YouTube. If you have any sort of problem or you're trying to figure out how to do something, there's a guy, I hope I pronounce his name correctly, Kenny Joya. Oh yeah, I think. Yeah, he runs a, a YouTube channel called Reaper Mania, and like, I mean, it's it literally anything that I've ever thought. Like, I wonder if I can do this. I'll just go type it in on his channel on YouTube, and he's got at least one video of how to do that. That's and, cool. Yeah, his videos are super concise. Like, he gets right to the point. Like, no fluff. Um, it's amazing. And then you know, if you're looking at some like really esoteric kind of, you know, parts of the program, you can get on the Reaper forums and it's probably been discussed in great length. So there, there's a good community around it now that I think took a while to kind of build, but it's there now. And so, you know, if, if you're looking for a DAW and uh, you want to try Reaper, that's, you're not going to be limited by not, uh, not having a resource for learning how to do things. Yeah. And then we've also had John Tidy on the show from um, Reaper blog. And, um, oh, right on. Yes. Similar, similar. I, he's got a bunch of stuff up there, too. Before your band hits the studio, it's smart to have all the songs and notes in one place. But setting up a shared cloud folder can be frustrating. There's always someone in the band who can't seem to log in or wants to use a different platform. Samply.app makes it easy to add collaborators to a project so that the whole band can upload new songs and make comments before the session. It's file sharing that was specifically built for music. Just upload a voice memo or song and start commenting. Sign up for your free account with two projects now 
now at Samply.app or use the coupon code RSR20 to get 20% off the first three months. Want to know how I get a consistent sound quality mixing hundreds of episodes of Recording Studio Rockstars? Well, I've been cheating all along by using Isotope RX and Ozone on every single episode. Right now, you're hearing RX D-Click, D-Clip, DS, Deplosive, Voice Denoise, Ozone, Multiband Compression, EQ, and Limiting on this podcast episode. Try out the subscription option with an extended 30-day free trial at isotope.com slash rockstars or use the code ROCK10 to get 10% off any individual plugin purchase. Well, very cool. Well, now the, the, I guess one thing we should mention about Reaper 2 is um, it tends to be a pretty affordable option, right? Yes, very, very affordable. I think the basic license is $60 and the, the, the small business license is 200 bucks, 250 bucks, I think. Right. And that's um, just a, an honor system too. It's like at the point where you say, okay, I'm, I'm making money from this. Then you, you get the other system. It's the, otherwise it's the same version. It's the same actual install, right? That's right. Yeah. They don't limit it at all. When you download the, the demo, you know, you get a 30 day trial but when that 30 days is up, it just asks you, hey, do you want to buy a license or are you still evaluating? Right. And you, you could theoretically s still evaluate forever. <laughs> and it's it's 100% the full program. They don't limit it in any way, which I think is cool. You know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think but it's, it's, great. So, it's so cheap, you know, you're, you're not going to be, um, especially with Reaper 6, like I've seen, uh, I haven't dug into all the new features they've added, but I think they're really trying to kind of make it look cooler and, and have some more kind of... Uh, you know, features and plugins that other DAWs like Logic and, and Pro Tools come with, mm -hmm. um, which, which is cool, which is cool. That's always been kind of the, the weakness of Reaper is... So it doesn't have, it doesn't come with instruments typically? Well, it, it comes with, it, it, well, it comes with a bunch of plugins, um, some of which are very good. Uh, it comes with a few VSTs, but it's not, I mean, they're pretty bare bones. Um, I haven't dug into them very deeply, but it's not like logic where you've got these great synths and right, like built-in right, okay. dr drummers and stuff. Okay. So, you know, I tend to use third-party plugins, so it doesn't, you know, it doesn't really matter too much to me, but yeah. Yeah. Um, all right, dig it. And then I think another thing worth mentioning about Reaper is it's sort of infinitely customizable, right? So you can yeah. create macros that will do similar to the way you can do it in Studio One, for example, but I think even on another level, you can create a macro that would do all kinds of crazy stuff and automatically edit things and go through a track or do whatever you might normally have to do that would take a bunch of steps. You yes. can create a one button click for it. Yeah. So they have their action list, which uh, you can search. It's, it's searchable, which is cool. So if you're like, how do I, like, what would you call this thing that I'm trying to do? Because, you know, different programs have different, you know, language that they use for uh, regions and mm -hmm. tracks and you know, clips and stuff. And so you can go in their action list and just kind of search and then it'll, it'll pull up all of the related actions that you can possibly do in the program. And what you can do from there is if it's something that you're doing a lot, you can create your own hotkeys. And so that's what I use a lot for um, editing podcasts is, you know, you've got your basic sort of pre-programmed editing tools, but uh, I often like to highlight, especially when I'm doing audiobooks and I'm I'm pasting in room tone to cover gaps. Um, that's pretty intensive editing, so I like to always know what color. I, I like to color the regions that are room tone, so I know kind of where my edit points are. So I've got I created a little hotkey where I can just hit you know a, a combination, and then it turns the track to the color that I want, um, so that I know that's room tone or that's a breath that was replaced or whatever. Okay, cool. Maybe you should uh, tell us what that's all about. So what is the room tone thing? I, that's actually something I don't do, but I know it exists, particularly in the world of film production. So talk, right. to, talk to us about how you incorporate that into your productions. Yeah, so that, that's something I, I actually, I borrowed the idea from the dialogue editors out there. There's a book by John Purcell uh, that's it's about dialogue editing. I forget what the title is off the top of my head, but it's a great book about how, you know, how a dialogue edit works. And you can borrow some of the ideas for podcast editing, for audiobook editing. But the, the basic idea is that, you know, in a film, you've got, you've got all of these different 
pieces of audio coming in from multiple sources. You might have a boom mic, you might have a, a lav mic on the actor, you might have a plant mic that's somewhere on the set, and they're all capturing you're literally audio. in a plant, right? Like sometimes literally in a plant, <laughs> but it, you know it could be behind the behind the car seat, you know, if it's an in car uh, 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 scene or whatever. And you know when you're in a when you're when you're looking at a, a an actual scene, it's in a physical space. Like you might be in a room in a house, or you might be in a warehouse. You might be outside in the woods. Yeah. And we all know, like the noise floor of these places sounds different. You know, like you might hear some birds chirping, or just kind of like the cicadas going off in the background if you're in the woods, or um, you know, it's not a perfectly zeroed out, clean digital zero noise floor. And so these dialogue editors have to be very careful about matching room tone as they're taking clips of audio, possibly from different takes that were done at different times. And so what they do is they, t they spend a lot of time capturing clean room tone of the location and pasting that over the, their edit so that they, when they have gaps where there's no dialogue happening, they've got a consistent room tone or consistent noise floor that sound that doesn't change in, in timbre and uh and, and decibel level. And the same thing works for audiobooks too. And so, you know, with an audiobook, hopefully your recording environment has a very low noise floor. But like I said, I record a lot of stuff that's kind of on location and in office buildings or, you know, just a, a spare room. And so the the noise floor is not perfect like a, you know, super isolated studio uh in an iso booth mm -hmm. so room tone allows me to basically go in and record you know 10 seconds let's say of you know just the room itself the electrical noise floor maybe the hvac that's going off in the room you know in, in in adjacent rooms hopefully we turn off the hvac for the recording room but you know stuff gets in the in anyway yeah and you've got this sort of it's not a zero noise floor but it's a very, very quiet noise floor, minus 60 dB maybe, or, 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 or lower. And you can use that, that clean capture to fill in the gaps of your audiobook. Um, and it's great for a lot of things. You know, it, first of all, it just makes it sound natural so that you're not dropping to digital zero between you know, clips of audio. Um, it sounds smoother. It also hides can hide a lot of incidental noises so if you kind of have you know a page turn that happens in between you know one section to another you can hide that by pasting room tone over it okay um so the so it's is do we think about this like um digital zero is always bad or is it more that is it more like if you have a controlled studio environment then it's okay to have sound just go away to nothing in between lines or voices, but when somebody hands you a recording that they did of a book on tape, you're going to need this, this extra trick to try and glue it all together in the yeah, mix process. I, and, and maybe, maybe even a lot of, a lot of commercial studios, you might have to do this too. You know, I'm sure there are some rooms that are, that are ultra isolated that have super low noise floors, but, uh, you know, if you have like a typical noise floor, like, you know, for music recording, if your noise floor is like minus 60, I mean, that's, that's pretty good. I mean, that's, that's, that's very usable. Mm -hmm. um, but that's something where like in an audiobook, that the change in, in timbre of the noise floor when it goes from nothing, digital zero, to the noise floor that's sitting underneath the vocal or the, uh, the spoken word, the dialogue track, whatever you want to call it, uh, you c it's noticeable sometimes. And yeah. this is the same reason I don't use a gate in podcasts. I don't like gating at all because it sound, it's very jarring. And the fact that when it drops to nothing and comes back up, um, that calls attention to it. I'm going to be gating you have, your voice when I mix this. <laughs> oh, you better not. <laughs> you better not. Uh, yeah, but you know, it calls attention to itself. And again, like I said, that you know, our ears are kind of primed to listen to the human voice in, in as much detail in more detail than any other frequency range. And so I, 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 f I find that's really distracting to me. And so I, I try to make that as smooth as possible. Yeah. No, I got, I got pushback for how I set the gate early on in the podcast. Um, I had a guest on and, and he was here in the gate kind of clipping and opening. And so I've worked even harder with my mix until I kind of got that sorted out. 
Yeah. And, um, yeah. yeah. And that's fascinating. That's cool. And so when would one of the things that sounds, you know, what it reminds me of is having the drummer finish a take and going, okay, can we just get individual drum hits so that we've got these safety samples? Do you uh, ask yeah. somebody who's recording a podcast or an audio book, if you aren't recording them, do you say, hey, can you let it roll for a little while and just leave the room? Give me an extra 30 seconds of just nothing going on. Yes. Yes. Now, to be clear, I don't do this for podcasts. It's it's kind of overkill. Although, although sometimes you might you might run into a situation where that um, where that can be hand uh, can come in handy. Um, yeah. This is mainly something I do for audiobooks, though, because audiobooks are you know it's a naked recording. You know, you, there's nowhere to hide. And when you have a podcast, you've got at least two people talking most of the time. You know, it's yeah. there are solo yeah. podcasts, but. When if you've got a conversation happening, you can hide a lot of stuff underneath the conversation, and the listener is going to be be drawn to each voice, and they're going to ignore all the junk that's happening in the noise floor of the person that's not talking. So you can you can actually get away with a lot more in a in a conversational podcast. Um, but I have one other little trick you can do there. Yeah, go Some, ahead. sometimes this works. If you need to do it on a podcast where it's just you know you're you're not going to take the time and effort to paste in room tone because um, it, it takes forever. It's it's very intensive process. What you can do is you can take your your clip of room tone and you want to make it fairly long. You know, you want at least 10 seconds, but preferably more like 20 or 30. Um, you can you can take that track and then clean it up. Do a little isotope or if you whatever noise reduction tool you have, do some light noise reduction on that and it'll just drop the the noise floor of that room tone a little bit more and it t- tends to smooth out you know, if there's like any sort of electrical buzz, it tends to kind of soften that a little bit. So you clean up that room tone clip and then you can just, you know, drag it across your, your uh, track view in your, in your DAW so that it just loops it and loop it underneath the whole podcast. So you got, so you basically, you set, create a separate track called room tone and then loop this cleaned up room tone all the way through your podcast. And, you know, when you do this, make sure that you don't have any clicks or pops on the beginning and end of the point. So, you right, know, if you record, right. yeah, you want to make, make sure a good you, loop, not a bad one. Yeah. Trim, trim those out. So it's, it's smooth and then isotope it a little bit or, or whatever you've got and then loop that, run it over your entire podcast. And then what you can do is you can basically gate that or, or set like an expander or something and have it open up when people stop talking. Yeah, so basically, nice. yeah, it's it's basically not playing at all when when conversation is happening, and then when somebody pauses and there's kind of some dead air, it, it the, the gate opens up, and then you hear the room tone kind of kind of you know flow in, and you can set you can play with your attack and release times to kind of get it to be smooth so that it opens up smoothly. Um, that can be a pretty cool way to do it if you need to, um, you know, if you've got like a unruly noise floor to to tame, well, but you don't want to. Yeah, you kind of automate it a little bit. That's cool. And it's, it seems like if you also just set it simply low enough, then you might not even need to gate it. You know, it just be yeah. masked by the voices talking and stuff. And it reminds right. me of um, some kind of, you know, earlier ninja techniques. I don't know if anybody's still doing this, but for a minute there, bouncing certain mixes out of Pro Tools, it could actually improve the sound of your mix to include an additional track that just had dither noise on it. And put that in the mix, ah. and it would do things like help the reverb tr- tails translate and stuff like that. Particularly, I think on high dynamic range content. So, like if you had an orchestral recording and you really needed the quiet zone to to taper in just right, um, if you added a dither noise track to your mix, it could improve the quality of that. I never got too deep into that, but I, I um, uh, Chris James would would hit me to that. Chris, if you're listening now, shout out to you. But he would talk about using those things. So that's a great yeah. tip, man. Cool yeah, stuff. Yeah, I think I think the main the main takeaway here is that what's going to get you in trouble with any sort of spoken word is a is a very a jarring change in the background, both noise and timbre. You know, so if you've got AC going on and half the recording and it's off the other half of the recording, you know, you're you're gonna hear during the AC part of the recording. <laughs> yeah. If you've got a gate or something, you're gonna really hear that because the the timbre of the background is going to change. Yep. Right. So that's the main thing is just pay attention to you want it to be smooth. And the brain is really good at ignoring 
steady state background noise. So um, just make sure that you're not, your edits are smooth and that, you know, if you're going to use these room tone things that they're, that they're crossfaded nicely and Dang then you'll be okay. Awesome. Yeah. The first rule of mixing is make good mix choices. To do that, you need to be able to hear your music clearly and accurately. Can you imagine trying to paint a masterpiece while wearing rose-colored glasses or choosing spices for a new recipe with no sense of taste or smell? You would blindly guess with every brush stroke or think that your cooking is amazing when actually it's terrible. That's how it feels to mix when the frequency response of your room is impacting the sound of your music. Even after you carefully position your speakers and sound treat your room, you're probably not getting an accurate sound at your mix position. The frequencies in your room can have huge peaks and valleys that are completely screwing up your perspective. This is where Sonarworks Sound ID Reference can help you with the affordable solution for calibrating EQ and balance of your speakers and headphones to give you an accurate flat frequency response. By helping you to hear your music clearly, you can now start to get your mixes right. Get a 21-day free trial at sonarworks.com. The API Select T12 is a two-channel, all-tube, Class A microphone preamp designed with API's proprietary AP2516 transformer on the input stage and a custom API transformer on the output stage. Built with the 12 AT7WC and 12 BH7 dual triode vacuum tubes, the T12 represents a new and exciting variation on API's classic preamp technology and provides you with unique tonal options for your studio handling a wide range of recording applications, including stereo operation. Carefully engineered to provide classic tube performance and sound, the T12 brings you API's famous warmth, punch, and clarity in a new design, including a five-year warranty. Check out the new T12 Tube Mic Pre and T25 Tube Compressor at apiaudio.com. Hey, Rockstars, we're back now for the jam session. My guest today is Trent Jones joining us from... His studio, which I think you guys call, you call it Marmalade Cream Media down in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Trent, are you ready to jam, my brother? Let's jam, dude. All right. So in, in jamming, I propose that we begin to talk about one of the very important things for making great records in the studio, for making a great mix, for recording great music, is just simply freaking being there. And in order to be there, if we want to be there for many decades, we got to think about a very important thing, which is how do we stay healthy? How do we live and survive and, you know, physically be present in the studio? Because the studio life and world is pretty demanding. It's sitting there with attention and focus for many, many hours a day. And it requires an additional level of commitment, I think, to our physical health and just to our bodies and to our minds to be able to continue to do this for a long time. Tell us about what you do. Tell us about strength training. I got lots of questions for you, but yeah. you know, give us an introduction to your take on all of that. Sure. Yeah. So man, health and fitness, it is a, uh, it's a huge topic. You know, this is how many books have been written about this. It's just, it's insane, right? Not enough, man. Not enough, <laughs> Not enough right? <laughs> Uh, well, I, you know, hopefully at the end of this, I'm going to convince you that maybe all you need is one book. Ooh. Um, but the Bible, yeah, um, that's not oh, the well, one we're talking yeah. about right now. Okay. Not, 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 not that one, but, <laughs> ma but maybe, but maybe, um, yeah. So my, my big thing is this, um, I, I became a coach because I saw a tremendous transformation in my life through strength training and fitness and just and getting fitter. And one of the things that I like about the starting strength method, which is how I've been trained and the the method I've come come up through, um, but but that is really kind of the method that people have used for, I mean, centuries. When we when we and we're going to talk about that in a second here. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things I like about it is it simplifies health and fitness. I get I get frustrated at the world out there of health and fitness and all the podcasts and the books and the blogs and stuff. It it makes it. A lot of people make it sound like you need a PhD to figure out anything about your health. 
in your body and how it works. Right. And, you know, this kind of, there's this, there's been this intense drive to scienceify. I'm going to make up a word here. Yeah. To just scienceify everything. Like, well, you know, in this study, they studied glycogen depletion and, it, and it's, you know, and it was big, it was higher in this type of training and not that training. So we need to do this type of training and not that training. Or, you know, coffee's good for you. Coffee's bad for you. Coffee's right. good for you again. Yeah. Oh, no, it's bad for you now. It, it's just like this endless stream of, of information and data. But the thing that's missing in, in just about all of these sources of information about health and fitness is there's no first principles, right? There's no okay. foundational sort of like, you know, underpinning or there's no model that tells you how to go from a, a state of not being fit and not being healthy to a state of being fit and being healthy, hmm. right? And if you have a basic model that's easy to understand, that's simple, then you can get yourself there and all the little details and permutations of programs and eat this, not that, and all that stuff, all that just becomes detail, right? It all just becomes kind of inconsequential in the long run. And so that, that's, that's my basic philosophy. And that's, that's you know, what I've learned from the Starting Strength book and the, the you know, sort of training model that we have is that if you have good first principles of fitness, then you can, you can make yourself fitter and healthier without having to, you know, just rely on, you know, grabbing a program from here and grabbing some information from there and hoping it all sort of kind of works out in the end. Yeah. So like if we were looking for first principles in the studio, we might think of things like get it right at the source or it's all about the song, stuff right. like that to just something that you can always look back to, to guide you. On That's the right. Yeah. You know, like if, you know, if you're, if you're setting up a mix and, you know, you get your gain staging right and you get your basic balances, the relative balances between the instruments right, and you kind of do some panning, I mean, you're most of the way there to a good mix. And, and all, the, all the little bits of processing and the details that we love to talk about, that just becomes kind of candy on top, right? But the foundation remains, uh, you know, I, I always like the, uh, is it Andy Wallace that had the kind of the four corners of the mix? Ooh, tell you us know? about that. I, I'm not um, sure if I know that well, one. Well, okay. So this is coming to me secondhand. I, 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 you know, I don't know Andy Wallace, um, unfortunately. I'd love to meet him someday. But I, I worked with a guy who did some mix coaching with me who had assisted Andy Wallace. And he said that he's got his sort of four corners of the mix, which is, um, I think it's like kick, snare, vocal, bass. Right. And it's like, if you get those four elements right, then everything else can kind of exist where, wherever, you know, and you've, you still got a solid mix. Yeah. Um, you know, you could, the guitars could be up, they could be down. It doesn't really matter if you've got the four corners, right? Yeah. And the, the, we could, we can apply the same thinking to fitness too, right? That if we, if we understand, um, the basics of how our body works and, and what fitness is, then we can, we can drop a few basic principles and, and build up any program off of that. Right on. Yeah. Fitness is not unfitness. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. That's a very, uh, yeah, it's a very Aristotelian way of stating it. Well, I like the way you said that, man. It made us all sound real fancy. <laughs> yeah. So what are some things that do become basic tenets of fitness to you? And what are some, you know, what, what's a way to look at it that we can start to easily apply to our own lives? Yeah, sure. So let's, let's talk about the, the problem that we face, first of all. You know, so I'm um, sitting in it right now. I'm sitting in that yes, problem. It's called a chair. Yeah, I am too, right? I'm sitting, I'm at a desk and I'm staring at this computer. I'm like slightly hunched forward because it's, it doesn't matter how much ergonomics you do. It's like, you're always end up kind of hunched forward. <laughs> right. <laughs> Have you found that? Like, it, yep. like I've well, got I just got a new chair right called, level. I got a new chair called the e-chair, which intentionally leans you forward slightly. So it's kind of in that way, it's good because it's actually, it's like, you're going to end up here. So let's get you supported with the forward. Okay. Means yeah. Slightly. It's, it's kind of anticipating the problem. Right. Um, yeah. And, and so like we, we live these lives that are sedentary, right? We spend hours and hours in the studio in a seated position, not moving around, not doing a lot of activity. Yeah. Elbows at our sides. Elbows at our sides. And so, you know, I think, I think we all realize at some level that that's not particularly good for us. You know, we yeah. are physical beings, um, whether we like it or not, we're physical beings and we live in a physical world. 
And that, you know, sometimes working in on computers and with digital things all the time, we, we kind of, we get abstracted from that, but, um, and, and you know, we're headed we live in more in that world. direction, probably, you know, with virtual reality and everything, it's yes. going to be even more important for us to be aware of this stuff if we want to keep going. Exactly. Exactly. So, um, you know, what, what are some of the follow on effects of this? Well, you know, we don't have much activity. So our metabolism is, is fairly low compared to what it could be. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it becomes easy to overeat because we don't have to eat that much to gain weight. And as we age, you know, part of the natural progression of aging is a decrease in testosterone levels uh, for both men and women and a decrease in metabolism, a yeah, decrease does, in, in muscle mass. It doesn't matter how loud you make that mix, rock stars, or how much you turn up those guitars, your testosterone's going down if you're sitting around. <laughs> It's going to go down. And I, I'm sorry to say that. It's just the natural progression of aging. And eventually we age to, until we're, we're dead, right? And so it's the natural progression of human life is a downward slide. Once you've, it's, it's a growth first in the early phase of your life. Then you sort of like taper off at a little bit of a plateau. Mm -hmm. And then it's a natural decline, right? And so when we're, when we're very sedentary, we basically are letting the decline happen as fast as we possibly can. Yeah. Yeah. And we're not we're not doing anything to counter that natural decline. And one of the things that I I enjoy about coaching is not to make people, you know, huge and jacked and muscular and, you know, be, become power lifters or whatever. That's cool too, right? And I I, you know, I've I've done that with some people, but I really like to train regular people and make them more functional and more useful and avoid or at least well, we can't avoid the decline but we can slow it down. We can make that line that's, gonna, that's declining to zero, we can make it as flat as we possibly can and improve our quality of life for as long as we can. Nice. And that, that's what I'm focused on. I want you to have higher quality of life because I can't guarantee you quantity. Right. You know? we, we don't know how long we're going to be here on this earth, but we can try and make it last as long as we want. And I personally, I, I just love making music. I love being in the studio. I want to be able to do this for as long as I can. I mean, I, I don't know what's going to happen when I'm in my seventies and eighties and nineties. If I, you know, hopefully that's where I'll be, but it sure would be cool to still be rocking out if there's, if there's a way to do that. Yes, absolutely. So I, I'm a member at the gear page, which is a forum for guitar nerds. And, um, you know, it's not a, it's not an uncommon complaint there of guys that are like, man, you know, I think I'm going to retire my four by twelves playing out, you know, right. like, yeah, I just can't pick them up anymore. My back's just, my back's wrecked. You know, I can't, mm. can't play my four by 12s. They're like, I got, can't bring the big amp anymore. And, um, you know, maybe the big amp is not appropriate for the gig. That's a whole different question, but what, what if it is, you know, like, are you like, you know, these guys, there's some guys that are, are missing out on the joy of playing, playing their rigs because they can't move the equipment. Yeah. And so this is something that that's not, that can be avoided, right? That's not the way it has to be. You can strengthen your back and make it to where it's trivial for you to go pick up that, you know, Mesa oversized four by 12 that weighs 95 pounds, you know? Yep. And, and you can be an asset and that's it. This stuff carries over to, to everything in life, right? You know, so it's moving stuff around the studio, um, having better posture, being more resilient when you have to go and help a help your friends move and pick stuff up. Um, so, so that's kind of, that, that's what I like to, uh, to focus on in my coaching practice is to help people become more useful. Um, there's a great quote from, from the guy who wrote the book, Starting Strength. Mm -hmm. He's a, he's a strength coach based out of Wichita Falls, Texas. His name is Mark Ripito. Nice. And, uh, his book, Starting Strength, he says in the, in the introduction to that, Says, he says, stronger people are harder to kill and more useful in general. Nice. It's and, funny. I think about a, Pat Metheny. He's got a record called As Wichita Falls. So falls Wichita Falls. <laughs> really cool. One. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a funny place. It is, it is Panhandle, West Texas, man. And, uh, and Rip, is he grew up there his whole life. So he's, he's a character. But he's, he's, he's been absolutely correct in my experience as I've trained you know, hundreds and hundreds of people over the last few years, he's been absolutely correct. You know, we can't control the things that happen to us in life. We can't control the diseases that we might get. 
We can't control, like we might get in a car wreck or, you know, heaven forbid things happen to us. But it's time and time and again has, has been sh- you know, shown to me in my own personal practice and, and in life that the people who are strong end up, they're more resilient. So they get less injured when those things happen. They bounce back faster. And along the way, they're more useful people to both to themselves and also to their community. You know, they're the people that are always kind of there to, um, for, the, for the people that are frail, that are weak, that, that can't do certain things for themselves. Yeah. I mean, just also just simply not getting sick. I mean, we live in a time where right. the thought of that has become this, you know, uh, this fear everywhere. And it's like, you know, the best way to not get sick is to just be healthy to begin with, you know, is to right. take care of yourself, eat well, exercise, be strong in your own constitution, be strong in your health and, you know, your, your immune system and start there. So yeah, I, I think this is, I think it's great, man. So, and one thing I wanted to say about the sedentary aspect too, just to point something out was when we don't use our body, our, our bodies are designed to adapt, right? So they'll, they'll change yeah. all the time and adapt. So if we don't use something, our body just says, well, I don't need to put a bunch of energy and resource into that. It's not getting used. Obviously, we're just not needing it right now. So it'll let things kind of um, muscles go down. It'll let, you you know, uh, strength go down. It'll let, I guess it'll let organs and stuff sort of not be used to their full potential. And so we have to, if we're going to sit in a chair in the studio all day and we're not using all that stuff, um, you know, our clicking finger is going to be rock solid strong from clicking on a mouse all day. Uh, unfortunately, our eyeballs won't get stronger staring at a screen. No. But, um, but you know, the rest of our body, if you don't want the rest of your body to get weaker and lose that strength to lift the amp, to even just uh, move stuff around the studio, even just to get up and walk around the studio, you got to get up and you have to do these things. You have to exercise it. You have to move those body parts. Yeah. So my, my mentor... Um, this guy by the name of Darren Deaton. He's based in uh, Dallas, Fort Worth area. He's a doctor of physical therapy and he's a starting strength coach as well. He's been a starting strength coach uh, almost since they started offering the credential like 12 years ago. And he's been a physical therapist for 30 years, I think. Uh, he's, he has a saying, motion is lotion. <laughs> okay, nice. <laughs> yeah, you know, it, it really is. So, you know, I think a lot of people have this idea about their bodies that it's sort of, it's a resource that you're born with, that, that once you use it up, it's done. Right. And um, that's wrong. Now, th- there are a couple of caveats to that. There are certain things in your body where that's true, like your cartilage, for instance. Like you grow a certain amount of cartilage and, you know, if, if your cartilage is totally worn away in a joint, then you're not really going to regrow that. All right. So that can be worn out. Right. But, but, there's so much more to your body than these, than these sort of wearable parts, right? We're not a car that, that we start brand new and we wear out till we, we get junked, right? right. Um, we're, we're a dynamic being like you, be, dynamic beings, like you pointed out, and, and the human body is made to adapt to stress. And I'm, I'm glad that you, you, you brought that up because if, if there's nothing else you get from this conversation, I want you to learn just a couple of basic principles of fitness. And here's, here's the first one. Um, all adaptation in our bodies happens via a simple model. And we call it the stress recovery adaptation model. So um, this was actually discovered by a scientist named Hans Selye in the early 1900s. He was studying, I think, microorganisms. But you know, this applies to pretty much every living being, that we're exposed to stimuli in our environment. And stimuli either kill us or they make us stronger or more adapted to whatever the insult of that stimuli is. Love it. So let's think about a suntan for a minute. Okay, so I'm, I'm sitting in my basement right now. Uh, that's where my studio is. Uh, I don't get a lot of sunlight. <laughs> yeah. So if I go out when the sun's shining in the summer and I'm pasty white, um, what's going to happen after about 10 minutes of if I take my shirt off? You get burnt or you go... Man, I'm getting too much sun. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. I'm, a, I'm on a sunburn, right? So what happened? Well, I have a certain baseline, which is you know, of, of my ability to handle the sun. 
And I go out and the sun is a massive stimulus because it's the middle of July and it's really hot and the sun is bright and burning. And so I go out there and that's the sun is basically the stress in our little stress recovery adaptation model. All right. Then I go back inside. I'm like, oh man, my skin's all pink. I put some lotion on, maybe some aloe or something. But I basically rest. I get away from the stimulus and I eat and I sleep and my body repairs itself. And eventually... I'm not red anymore. And I might actually have a little bit of a tan, right? Yeah. I might get a little bit darker and I can go do that successively and expose myself to a little bit more sun every time, right? And so that's what happened there. Well, we had a stress, which was the sun. We had the recovery process, which is basically sleep and food and rest. And then we had an adaptation and the adaptation was specific to what the stimulus was. The stimulus was the sun. Our adaptation is we get browner um, so that our skin can handle more sun next time. And this is true of all organisms. If you stay out in the sun forever, if you drop yourself in the middle of the Gobi Desert and you do that, if you stay long enough, you're going to die, right? right? But if you have just a little bit of stimulus, what'll happen is you won't die. You'll just, you'll be a little pink for a while and then you'll adapt and you'll, you'll be able to handle more. Okay, so we can, we can, actually apply the same thinking to our fitness. How do you go from a position of being weak to, to being strong? How do you go from a position of being, you know, unconditioned where you, you can't jog down the street and back to being conditioned? You just go into the gym and you try and lift 500 pound barbell, right? It's right off the bat. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, that, that seems to be like everybody's, everybody's first thought when I, when I, when I mention the word barbells, they're like, wait a minute. No, that's like the picture of the dude that's like, looks like Arnold Schwarzenegger deadlifting 900 pounds. Yeah, which is, um, which is by the way, that was probably our, our last guest, David Nyatsi, um, was just on the podcast and he was, he's doing a, I think he's deadlifting 500 pounds. So Ooh, yeah. you, you can just oh, rewind we'll have to have a deadlift. if you need that. Yeah. We'll have to have a deadlift competition be, between me and him. Oh we'll man, we'll oh, watch out, oh, watch out. We'll see yeah, because but yeah, but he's I've seen him on uh, on YouTube, right? Yeah, he's very muscular. He's very lean. He's got he's got a great body composition. Yeah. So, but but you know that didn't happen overnight. Exactly. And that's the same thing with these guys that are lifting you know huge weights. Is a it didn't happen overnight, and b those guys are genetically gifted for that sport. It's the same you know? thing with people who are mixing amazing sounding mixes. It didn't happen overnight. It's something that you incrementally improve one percent at a time. Exactly. Exactly. And the same thing is true of fitness. So, you know, kind of get it out of your head that, that lifting barbells is um, that you have to go and lift like massive weights. Um, that's not how it works at all. Um, in fact, you know, strength training, part of the reason why I like that specifically is that I can scale it to anybody. You know, I, I've coached, um, I coached a guy a couple years ago who was 73 and he was getting ready to have two hip replacements. He needed a total hip replacement both hips. Wow. And he basically came to me and he's like, you know, Hey, he, he, he had done enough reading to understand. He's like, I need to be as strong as I can before I go into the surgery so that, you know, in, in the weeks after the, the surgeries, I can be walking instead of being in a wheelchair. Um, because he knew if he was, if he was physically weak, when he went into the surgery, he was much more likely to be bound to a wheelchair and it was going to be a really hard battle to get back to walking again. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, so I worked with him and, and, you know, the guy 70 was 73 at the time. He's not, he doesn't move like a 23 year old, right? The joints don't go in the same place as they used to. They don't bend as far, but, but what we could do is we could start at a very low weight, very controlled, and I could add very little bits of weight at a time to build his strength. Right. So it can be scaled to, um, someone that, you know, can, can pick up, you know, if 10 pounds is all you can pick up, that's fine. We can do that with a barbell. If you need to start at 225, we can do that too. Um, and there's not very many, you know, fitness sort of modalities as we call them. There's not many fitness modalities where you can do that. You know, I can't, I can't take someone who's very deconditioned and be like, okay, so we're going to do a wad today. We're going to do Fran. <laughs> what are those things? And I, I think Fran is the CrossFit workout where uh, I'm pretty sure that's the one where you do a bunch of like thrusters and pull-ups, mm -hmm. you know, like I, I can't take somebody who like, if you can't, if you can't do a body weight squat, then how are you supposed to do a thruster? Right. 
if you can't do a, a single chin up, like how am I supposed to have you do a bunch of them for time? Yeah, I was trying to learn uh, how to do something called the um, the muscle up the other day, where you do a pull up and then you go up above the bar and push yourself up. And I was like, I was like, I'm gonna, I'm, I've been doing some pull ups. I'm feeling pretty good. I'm gonna be able to do this. I couldn't even get one started. So right, it takes yeah, so it takes some technique. Yeah, and it, it takes like a baseline level of strength to do that. Um, and if you just don't have it, then, then, you know, how are you going to get to that first muscle right, up? Right. So, so, you know, so to kind of back up a little bit, um, that's the first principle is stress recovery adaptation. You have to have a stimulus in order to get more fit, right? And I'm, I'm using fit as a very generalized term. What I really want you to do is I want you to get stronger first. And then all the other elements of fitness will come later. And right. you, you know, and it's not the only thing that I do. I don't only do strength training with people, but it is the starting point. Um, and we can talk about that some more if you want. Have you ever wished you could remove the click track bleed from a singer's vocal mic, the sound of shuffling feet from a full choir? or clicking noises from the valves of an otherwise brilliant trumpet solo. These are just some of the incredible things I've been able to clean up, edit, or remove from a recording using the magic of Isotope RX. Great for mixing with a collection of plugins for your DAW to manage plosives, clicks, S's, noise, buzz, reverb, breaths, and even guitar fret squeaks with a set it and forget it simplicity that lets you focus on your creativity in the studio while you let Isotope handle the audio challenges. If you've ever wanted to truly feel like a magician in the studio, then Isotope RX is your magic wand. Try out the subscription option with an extended 30-day free trial at isotope.com slash rockstars or use the code ROCK10 to get 10% off any individual plugin purchase. So you just finished an awesome mix and sent it off to the band, but the singer texts you with lyric changes, the drummer emails you wanting a different fill, and the bass player DMs you on Instagram about a wrong note in the chorus. But which mix version are they talking about anyway? Don't you wish there was an easier way? Sampley.app comes to the rescue as your ultimate mix assistant, streaming high quality mixes so your clients can easily listen and send notes from their mobile phone on the road or a computer back in the studio. All mix comments are time stamped directly onto the correct mix version with no confusion and everything is easy to find in one location. No more mixed up mix messages from the band. It's file sharing that was specifically built for music and it all works in your browser with no downloads required. Sign up for your free account with two projects now at sampley.app and use the coupon code RSR20 to get 20% off the first three months when you're ready to upgrade. Well, so so one of the things about getting stronger too is, is that I feel like I've had to learn is what a, you you got different muscles in your body. So you got like the big ones that do the big movements, and then you've got all these supporting muscles. So this is one of the things you learn when you first go to try to to bench press, for example, and and you're right. like, I should be able to do that, and then you're like, oh my god, I'm I'm about to crush my neck because I can't lift the bar, you know, and get yeah. out from under it, and you realize that first you have to kind of strengthen the weakest muscles, I think. And you can correct me if I'm wrong in the way I'm looking at this, but those those smaller muscles, the supporting ones need to be there before the bigger ones can start to really take on some of the the heavier stuff or the bigger movements and actions. Well, uh, you're not wrong, but I don't think about it like that, actually. Okay. So the thing is, your body is a system, Right, our musculoskeletal system. I thought your body is a wonderland. Oh, sorry, wrong song. <laughs> yeah, wrong podcast. I don't. I. I think I'm pretty confident that I can bench press more than John Mayer. <laughs> um, nice. Yeah, but can you play as many notes in a solo? Uh, no, no, All I right. can't play like him. All so right. he's he's got me there. But, um, but yeah. So I, I I think about the body as it's a system, and we use our bodies as a system. We we don't really do isolated, you know, activities naturally. Now you think about like the things that you do in natural human movement, you, you bend at the hips, um, you squat down to do a variety of activities. Mm -hmm. You want to sit, sit down in a chair and stand up again. Um, you, that's a squat. Basically you lift things overhead, you pick things up off the ground. Right. And, and, you know, many variations of that, that's normal human movement and things that we do all the time. 
And in each of those cases, we're, we're never using just one muscle group. Right. Right. It's always a system of a bunch of muscles all working together in concert. And so that's the way, that's the way we ought to train too. Um, and that's, that's what a good strength training program is going to, to focus on first is training what we call the compound movements. Right. Right. And that compound just means that we're moving multiple joints at the same time. So guess what, guess what we do when I, when I put somebody that's a, a brand new beginner on a strength training program, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to squat. See, to me, that's, that's like the squat is still the scary one. I don't know. It's, it's the it one is, that's yeah. so hard to figure out. And sure, is it because sure. when we start out, we have a tendency to try and overdo it? Is that, uh, is that something yes. that, that many of us run into? If you're male in particular. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like we all want to, like we all want to, we all remember what we did in high school, you know, if, if we squatted at all. And we're like, oh yeah, man, I used to do that. I, let me just throw it on. I bet I still got it. Um, but yeah, the, the squat can be very scary, but remember it's, it's really, it's just, it's just loaded human movement. So for instance, if I, if I take somebody who's, who's very, very weak or very deconditioned, um, I may not have them use any weight at all. I'll teach them to squat with their body weight. Mm -hmm. And we might even start by squatting to a chair and back up. Right. So we're actually mimicking something that they're going to have to do in their everyday life all the time, which is sit down in a chair and stand back up. Um, but they're going to have to use their hip muscles, the muscles around their hips, their hamstrings, their glutes, their quads, their abs, their back, all that stuff working together instead of using their hands to push themselves off the chair. Like you'll, you'll see people do sometimes. Yeah. Right. And then you, you can just scale that up from there. If you've got, you know, if I'm working with somebody that has a higher uh, starting level of fitness, then we'll put a bar on your back, right? And we'll put a little bit of weight on there and teach you how to control that weight and, and, and squat correctly. Still getting up out of a chair or now going over to some kind of fancy squat barbell machine? Well, we'll, we'll, uh, well, we'll, we'll just use the free weight barbell um, inside, a, inside a squat rack. But, um, but it all starts with the basic unloaded um, human squat, which is, which, you know, basically we do a squat whenever we're standing up out of a chair we do a squat all the time when we're bending over to pick yeah, something up. Yeah. Um, so, well, so the point here, the point I want to drive home here is that um, basic principles is use compound lifts as the basis of your fitness because that mimics what we do in, in real life. Okay. All right. Yeah. And at, you know, just, just simply to sort of stay on track here for us because we're in a recording studio podcast, yet we love to talk about staying healthy getting yeah. more fit if we want to. And because somebody who's probably interested in advanced fitness stuff is probably already listening to a fitness podcast. Let's, let's give the rock stars some kind of beginner tip breakdown. So for example, if somebody wants to start um, improving their fitness routine in balance with their studio life and Maybe they have access to a gym, so you could talk about some basic starting tips there, or maybe they don't have weights and they're like, you know, because I, I don't want people to feel discouraged if they can't get right. to a fully loaded weight room or even to a gym. Because I know with my studio routine, sometimes even just getting from the studio to the YMCA for a break to go work out and get back to the studio again was a huge challenge. I, I literally had to give up my dinner break so that I could do that instead. And I was just like, how fast can I make a smoothie and drink this while I'm back at the computer editing again? Right, right. So, so talk a little bit about some, some simple, like super achievable, um, you know, low, uh, what's the word, low barrier um, uh, uh, options for the rock stars yeah. as far as like, look, if you're not doing anything, you're already feeling a little bit like you got some weight to lose. You're already feeling like I need, you need to improve your diet and you're like, but you want to, you want to do something. What, what right. would you, what tips would you give about some basic exercises that would really help people out? Yeah, sure. So let's start with the, uh, with another first principle here. Focus on intensity first. Okay. So, so intensity is, um, you know, in, in basic terms, it's, it's just how hard is the thing that you're, that you're doing? Um, I like to, you know, you can illustrate that this pretty easily with running. Like I think most people have, um, have, have run to some extent, 
Mm-hmm. So you think about doing like, uh, like if I ask you to go jog a mile, right? That's not a very intense activity. Um, I didn't Depends say it on be, who you ask. <laughs> well, I was about to say, well, but it, that doesn't mean it's not hard, right? It might be hard and you might, you know, your heart might be pumping and your, your lungs might be burning while you're trying to do that. But let's contrast that now with a hundred meter sprint. Right. Okay. So like you can obviously do a hundred meter sprint faster than you can a one mile run. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and you can do a one mile run faster than you can a five mile run. So what I'm describing here is intensity. The hundred meter sprint is pretty close to the top end of your intensity, right? It's hard to kind of go more. You can't really run any faster than that or any harder than that, right? But you can slow it down and you could go further, right? That would be what we would call volume, right? You could, you could do more if you go at a slower pace. Right. That's right? like my marathon trainings were like that, where I was not trying to super push myself. I was just trying to get in a zone and run for long time too yeah, long. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. When you're doing those, you have to build, uh, you have to build both. Right. But, but we're looking for bang for our buck here, right? How are you going to get the most out of your fitness in a, in the smallest amount of time? So focus on intensity first. And, you know, we can talk a little bit about the science of why that works. There's some good science behind it, but, um, I'll just leave it at that for now. Do things that are, that are hard, short and intense. Okay. And um, I actually, I actually sent you a uh, a little PDF that you can share with uh, with the rock stars here. Great. I these are twenty. It's it's a little PDF of twenty workouts you can do at home or at the studio even. That's awesome. And um, these are these are what we would call most of them are what we would call high intensity interval training. It's the fancy word for it. Hit workouts. Mm-hmm. But they are um, they're either body weight or just kind of low equipment. You know, it's stuff like, uh, you know, if you've got like a single d- dumbbell or kettlebell, you could do these. Or if you've got like, you can make a heavy bag by filling a duffel bag full of rocks or sand or something like that. Um, it, it, you can you can do it. There's a 20 different workouts you can do. And you can just pick one of these. How about those cinder and, blocks that are sitting around the studio? Yeah, yeah. Grab a cinder place. block. You could do it. You can do squats while holding a cinder block in front of you. Um, there's lots of different things you can do there. But all of these are are different variations of high intensity, um, what we call conditioning workouts, right? And and these are, you know, the reason you want to focus on intensity first is because you're going to get the greatest bang for your buck. Mm-hmm. Um, essentially, you have the most metabolic activity from high intensity work, and you stay in an elevated sort of metabolic zone. That's not a scientific word there, but I'll, I'll you know. The, are you talking word. about the MZ? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The MZ, right? So, so you know about it too. <laughs> no, it's not a scientific term, but, but basically you stay in, in like an elevated state of, of calorie burn, if mm-hmm. you will, um, when you do high intensity work over low intensity work, right? So what I'm saying is that do these workouts instead of jogging around the block. Right. And, so you're and, not just trying to warm up. You're trying to Push yourself. That's right. How you do have, you how do you know whether or not something you just did was high intensity or not? Yeah, maybe that's you a, feel like that very first squat is high intensity. Yes, absolutely. So remember, let's go back to our model, right? Stress recovery adaptation. Um, when we are stressing our bodies, and that's what we're doing. When we when we exercise, when we work out, we're stressing our bodies. And uh, by the way, when I say this, this is good stress. There's bad stress too. Right. We're not right? trying to damage like, ourselves. Yeah, if you get the flu, that's that's stress on your body for sure, but that's bad stress. That's stress that you got to recover from just to get back to where you were. Right. Um this is exercise is good stress. This is stress that's going to force our body to adapt by getting more conditioned, by getting stronger, by building more muscle mass. Um and so simply put is a stress is anything that disrupts your homeostasis. In other words, it's anything that is hard enough to cause an adaptation. So, you know, the first time you go out and do one of these workouts, you may only, you may only be able to do half the reps in a given workout, or you might only be able to do it very slowly. That's fine. The way that you progress is by doing, you know, the next time you do it, you do one more rep on yeah, each of the sets. Yeah. Or the next time you do it, you do it a little bit faster. Like try to do it 10 seconds faster. Not, well, not, 
a minute faster. Just try to do it a few seconds faster than you did. Yeah, yeah. And that's a cool, that that is a really good takeaway because you you learn that that like the greatest athletes in the world who do incredible stuff, when they're trying to advance, you know, you discover that they're only trying to go like 1% better than they were. And that's that's a huge right. win for them. And it's that incremental adding on to stuff that gets them to a level where they're doing something that just strikes you as like, you know, beyond your reach or whatever. That's uh, right. Yeah. And and same thing with lifting and weights. Uh, I'll circle back with a tough question, like, because sometimes it's hard to kind of keep that routine going. But there's something called like a hundred push-up challenge where you start out and you're just doing every day, you're doing, um, you know, so many push-ups and then so many and so many. And then you start adding one on every day after that. And eventually you get to a point where you're like, holy shit, I just did a hundred push-ups. And you, you know, where you started out and you couldn't do that many. But what's cool about that is sometimes those things start out where it's okay to start where that first round is not that hard for you, right? That's you're, right. You're not really getting huge intensity at the very beginning of the process. Exactly, right? Intensity is always relative to the individual. You know, like I said, when when some people come into my gym, um, the first day we might be doing just body weight squats to a box. Like they may not even be able to hold their body weight all the way to to depth, right? They may only be able to go halfway down. That's okay. Right? It doesn't matter. I, I really don't care where you start. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to continue to progress by making a little bit harder every time. So the next time they come in, they'll be doing body weight squats again, but we're going to lower the box that they squat to by an inch or two. Okay. So if right? the rock stars are kind of self-guiding their the, this new workout routine, what are some of the basic exercises that you would encourage them to stitch together into a routine? You know, how many days a week do we need to try and find time for this? And yeah. then, and then how do we keep track of it so that we're, you know, we're incrementally improving it? How important is that too? And then like, is it okay if we kind of slip back and, and we're, you know, that kind of thing? Absolutely. Yeah. So in general, um, and, and I'll, I'll talk about this, like, let's talk about sort of like the workouts you can do from home at first. And then I want to talk about sort of what's optimal, right? If you, if you want to go to the next level here, because okay. I think, I think that the next level is more accessible than you might think it is. Okay. Um, but, but yeah, so let's, let's just talk about if you're just doing sort of these workouts in the worksheet or something similar at home. In general, I say start with three workouts a week and do them every other day. So Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, something like that. And that gives you a little bit of a rest day in between. It gives you a rest day. And that's, that's really important. You know, it's, remember there's the R is in the middle of the equation. We have an SRA equation. You have to recover from what you've done in order to adapt. If you never give yourself time for recovery, then you're just going to keep digging a hole and digging a hole and digging a hole. And eventually you get injured and your fitness goes down. Right. And right? again, that's stress, recover, adapt. That's right. right? That's right. You got to okay. have the recovery. And the recovery is basically, there's, there's really only two recovery factors we can really control. And that's what we eat and how much we sleep. Okay. Dig it. Yeah. Talk about those. Yeah. Well, let's. What should we uh, eat and how well, long should we sleep? <laughs> well, let's, let's get back to that in just a sec. Let's get back to that in a sec. We'll, okay. we'll talk about the, the recovery more. So you're going to be doing three workouts a week on, let, let's just say, a Monday, Wednesday, Friday schedule, right? If you want to do something more than that, maybe some light activity would be good on, uh, if you're doing Monday, Wednesday, Friday, maybe like some light activity on, on the other days. Yeah, that's fine. Or, or that you, slow jog that really didn't, wasn't too yeah, intense. That's right. If you want to go walk or do some hiking or stuff, there's some mental benefits to that that, you know, that, are, that are great. You know? So I'm not saying that you can't do that. It's just that you don't be doing intense activity every single day because you're not, not to the you same can't handle that yet. Anyway. Not to the same muscle groups, right? That's right. Well, you, you, yeah, exactly. You can't handle the high intensity work every single day yet. You can get there, right? But, but not yet. You got to give yourself time to recover first. Okay, cool. Okay. Um, and if you're not doing work that's intense enough, then you know, you're not going to stimulate that adaptation anyway, right? So it's just kind of both sides of the coin there. Okay. All right. So, so let's just say we're doing Monday, Wednesday, Friday. How much right. time do we need for our little workout break to get started? Well, I would say that if you're if you're doing workouts like from this uh, from this worksheet, um, pick pick a fast one, 
and then pick a slow one, right? Because some of these are longer and slower in pace. Mm -hmm. um, pick a fast one and do that first. And then the next workout, do a slow one. And the next one, next workout, do a fast one, right? So the, the pattern will be fast, slow, fast, slow, fast, slow on the following week, right? And it'll just alternate. So the, the fast one, some of these are, um, you know, as, as, as short as a few minutes, right? So like maybe 10 minutes, you're done. So you'd have a warm up time of five to 10 minutes. You don't need a lot. Um, and then you do your workout. And then, you know, maybe you do a little optional like cool down work, but that's, that's not, not necessary. So mm -hmm. you can do some of these conditioning workouts in as little as 20 to 30 minutes. Which is awesome because that makes it way easier to put into our busy routines and go, you know what? I can, I can find time for this. And I yeah. encourage you rock stars to, um, you know, think, think possible and whatever the obstacle is where you're like, ah, but how am I going to get to the gym? And what about taking a shower afterwards? Start deleting those things. Just go like, you know what, what happens <laughs> right. if I just don't worry about it? What happens if I did my 10 minute workout, didn't have time for a shower and went back to the studio or whatever I'm doing? Um, because yeah. I often surprise myself that of just how possible it is to get a workout in in the most unlikely situations. Yeah, one one of my favorite conditioning workouts, and I wouldn't recommend starting with these. Okay, um, but one of my favorite conditioning workouts is called uh, the the tab a Tabata, and I'll do it on the uh, dude. I've the got road. my timer has something called the Tabata. I was like, what is that? Is this like some okay. strange Indian oh, yes. term or it came from China? Uh, I, don't know I, what I, it I believe. Is. It's from a researcher. I believe he was Japanese. Um, and I don't know the story behind his research, but basically he figured out that you can actually get a really good conditioning effect from an extremely short but very intense uh, workout program. And so the, the Tabata, um, I usually do it on what's called an Echo Bike. That's a Rogue Echo Bike. Some other brands are like the Assault Bike. So it's like a, it's basically a bike that when you pedal, the resistance grows as you pedal harder. Because it's the the pedals are connected to a fan, mm -hmm. which basically pushes more and more air the more the harder you pedal, and then your arms are pumping back and forth too. Okay, um, so that's so assault bike or echo bike, and um, a, a basic Tabata workout would be like this: eight rounds. You do a twenty second sprint as hard as you can. It's all out effort for twenty seconds. So you sprint, 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 and then you rest for ten seconds. That's one round. 20 second sprint, 10 second rest. Okay. And then, then you do the second round. The same thing. Eight rounds in a row, 20 second sprint, 10 second rest. Okay. That will utterly crush you, but it's only four minutes long. Right. The whole thing is four, takes four minutes to do. Now, obviously you want to be warmed up before you start it. You wouldn't go in totally cold and try to knock one of these out. That's a good way to get injured. Um, but usually this is something that personally I would do after my, my strength training, I, I would do maybe a couple of barbell lifts and then I'd go knock one of these out, but there you go. There's, that's a four minute workout and it, that, that will do a lot to build your conditioning. 50 years ago, William G. Dilley introduced the world to his revolutionary new dynamics processor, the Model 610 Comp Limiter. A truly unique device, the Model 610 was not only the fastest, cleanest, and quietest of its type, but was also capable of providing completely separate peak limiting and compression functions. Today, Spectra 1964 introduces the Model C610 Comp Limiter, described as the most versatile piece of audio gear you can buy. Great for adding control and power Powered everything from vocals, guitars, and bass to mixing and even mastering, the C610 gives you the same massive sound that rocked legendary studios like Stax, Arden, Advision, AM, and Record Plant. I'm using the C610 on every record I make at the Toy Box Studio, and you should too. You'll love it. Go to Spectra1964.com or call 801-797-0642. OWC now brings you the MiniStack STX, the world's first Thunderbolt 4 certified storage and hub expander, perfectly sized to stack with the Mac Mini, and the ideal storage and connectivity companion for Thunderbolt or USB equipped computers and devices. With the SATA HDD SSD bay and NVMe M.2 PCIe SSD slot, you can expand your Mini's storage capacity to gigantic proportions. Three Thunderbolt USB C ports, 
enable you to connect to millions of Thunderbolt, USB, and future USB 4 drives, displays, AV mixers, cameras, and tablets, as well as desktop accessories like a keyboard, card reader, or mouse. I'm using the Mini Stack STX paired with my Mac Mini M1 to house my dedicated audio SSD and sample libraries at my studio, and it works great. Find the new Mini Stack STX and all your storage needs at MacSales.com slash Rockstars. Now, when you say sprint, I think of running outside. Um, are there things that you could do that would be 20 second sprints indoors if you if you don't have a place to go outside and run or if you've got a, you know, you only have an indoor timer and you're in a gym or is this really meant for the, you know, the kind of sprinting outside thing? Well, it's, um, yeah, it, it's, it, it works best with things that you can, you can do at different levels of intensity. So, you know, for instance, you can apply this to body weight movements. There's actually a workout in this sheet that's uh, Tabata air squats, push-ups, and burpees. Oh, man. Um, and, and you can do that. But, but um, the thing is, like, you can't really do an air squat, you know, with more intensity or less intensity. It's just an air squat. Right. 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 The only way you can add intensity to an air squat is to put weight on your back and add more load to the movement. And right? is that okay to do if you're trying to do the Tabata squats? Um, uh, I wouldn't recommend it. Right. I wouldn't because recommend the way it. You, you start getting into the, you might injure yourself by moving too fast with weights. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. When we're strength training, we're doing something different than when we're conditioning. Okay. Um, and I want to, we'll talk about that here in a second, but, um, yeah, so, so you, you can do it with body weight movements, but it works best when you're doing something that has like, you can push a bike, you can, you can pedal a bike slower or faster, right? Um, it's kind of a, a nice continuum. So yeah. It and works well on a nice bike. Thing, nice thing about sprinting is rock stars, like I don't care where you are in the world with the studio. There's probably, you can probably leave the studio when you probably need a little sunshine for a break anyway, but right. you can get outside and running is about as accessible as anything there is. So this like yes. tiny, you know, and, and a, a stopwatch, some kind of watch that will just do 20 second and 10 second intervals. I think I have the, um, what is it called? The Iron Man series from yeah. Timex or whatever. They're cheap. Um, you can get the lowest, you know, the low rent watt version of the watch and it's got that, that interval stuff in it. Right. But, um, that's really cool, man. And it's intense. I've done some interval sprints and it is really hard, Yeah, but and it's there's so lots, good for you. There's lots of ways to do this. Um, you know, you don't have to do Tabatas. In fact, when I start people doing these, I'll usually flip it around. I'll do 10 second sprint, 20 second rest. Okay. Dig it. Great. Right. And then, then the next time, you know, you do that for a few, a couple of weeks, and then maybe you do 15 second sprint, 15 second rest. And the other thing I want to point out, since you mentioned running specifically, if you're going to go running, um, a couple of rules of thumb, you know, unless if you're over the age of 25, <laughs> uh, you know, don't ever sprint a hundred percent full out, like on a track, just keep it at like 80 to 90% max because you know, when you're sprinting, you're, it involves a, a, a very high impact force on your joints. Mm -hmm. And um, it's probably, unless you are like trying to train in a sport that requires sprinting or you're trying to be a competitive runner or something, it's just probably not worth the risk of, of possible injury, right? And you can, like people will pull calves and hamstrings and stuff. Yeah, or your knee. Yeah, or, or knees. And that generally happens when people are operating at the extremes of of their capacity, right? Yeah. So if you're trying to absolute just 100% max effort sprint, back it down to like 90, 85% and you'll be fine. You're going to get the same effect, but you're not, you're just not going to expose yourself to something that's ultimately going to, to, you know, possibly get you injured and then, you know, kind of be counter to what you're trying to do in the first place is, yeah, which is and to I, get healthier. I think it this helps is why, to focus on form and just like, just get more zoned yeah. in on your form too. That's right. And this is why like, I like, um, there, there are, there are some, you know, sprinting tends to be very high impact. It's hard to do low impact. So I like an echo bike or a rower or like a sled that you can push, you know, if, you know, or like an object that you can do reps with. Um, I prefer those because those can be done intensely, but with less care for technique. Like yeah. they just require less technique. So you don't have to worry about the, the impact on your body as much. Yeah. All yeah. right. So, so that's basically, so that basically intensity, you know, start low and ramp it up over time and it has to get harder over time. If it doesn't get harder, you're not going to make more progress. 
Now, just just to push back on that a little bit, yeah. Is it okay to not always make progress? In other words, is it okay to to increase our fitness to a little bit of a certain level and then just try and maintain and stay there because we're just thinking I just, you know, I want to just stay healthy and stuff as opposed to always feeling like because I, it's it can be discouraging sometimes if you feel like you're failing, like you say you go back to the gym and you're like, I can I can squat that weight like I used to, and then you can't. <laughs> so I <laughs> oh, just don't yes. want I don't want people to be discouraged by not reaching certain benchmarks. And in fact, I would even say rock stars if you're going to start the Tabata thing, you know, and you and you're already like feeling like, good lord, how am I going to do this when you're trying to hit that 10 second mark? Just right. it's okay. Don't sweat it. Yeah, just, that's just okay. go to where you know you're pushing yourself and do that. And then, you know, come back and you'll, I find even without trying to achieve more next time, my body sort of naturally can tell, tell itself, hey, I'm capable of one more step this next, next right. go around. Yeah, exactly. I want, I want to be clear here. I really don't care where you start. You, you know, it, it doesn't matter. What I care about is the progression. And, and I think it's probably a good mental practice to start, start thinking about your fitness in terms of what is my strategy for progressing rather than what the result is, right? Because, you know, like life, as, as we all know, right, life does not move linearly. Um, things pop up, right? You get busy projects and you can't work out. You know, there, you don't, you don't have a chance to, or, you know, there's, yep. there's, uh, stress in your home life that pops up or you get sick or whatever. There's all sorts of things or that happen in life. You got to get that mix done. You got to stay up all night. That's right. You got to stay up all night. And then the next day you're, you're exhausted because you stayed up all night, right? So things happen, right? And so if you're, if you put all of your focus on the end result, like oh, I want to be able to do, and you pick an arbitrary number, like I want to be able to do that or for this time or this amount of weight, or I want to have this body. Well, then, then you're, that's a that's a quick road to discouragement because there's so many factors that go into that and you can only control so many of them right you can't control when you get sick or when crazy you know projects pop up or whatever but you can control your consistency and and you know getting in there and doing the work right um but yeah just realize you're not going to be the same person every time you go and work out and that's okay but what we're looking for is over time that things are continually progressing and, and to answer your question, Lidge, we want, we want that because there is going to come a time where you can't progress anymore, mm -hmm. right? And so in the starting strength world, we talk about this in terms of uh, phases of advancement. We call people novices when they start, and it has nothing to do with how long they've been in the gym. You know, we, I've trained guys that have lifted weights for 15 years, and they come to me and it's like, they're a novice, strength trained. Mm -hmm. trainee, right? And it's, it's nothing to do with experience. What it is, is that they have the ability to go in and train and make progress every single workout for a short period of time. And then eventually you just can't do it anymore. You can't recover from that work as you get stronger and stronger and stronger. And this, okay. this apply, everything that I'm saying applies to conditioning too, right? Like we were talking about earlier, you, you get to a point where like, you just can't do more, right? And, and then, so then what, what happens? Well, then you become an intermediate trainee, right? Where it, it basically you have to do multiple workouts worth of work in order to get one unit of adaptation, right? right? It then slows you down. To, your, your, your routine, your workout routine uh, changes. You start getting more yeah, you, specific you have to do, about certain areas and certain zones and stuff like that. Exactly, exactly. And so realistically, for most of us that just want to be generally healthy and fit, um, we're probably not going to make it to that intermediate stage of training. Or if we do, we might become intermediates for a little while and then something will happen in life and we'll have to back down a little bit and we'll be novices again. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people will never become more than novice in training advancement. And that's okay. Yeah. Nothing wrong with that's that. Okay. Nothing wrong with that. But the thing is you need to, you need to think about you know, your training in terms of, of progress, of, of progressively overloading or increasing the work that you're doing because things will pop up to push you back down. Yeah. That's just the way life is. Yeah. And, and I mean, again, I, I think our end goal here talking about this stuff is how do we stay well enough and still stay fit enough that we can continue to keep our life going in the studio and we don't feel like the studio life is somehow killing us, you know? 
That's right. So That's I think right. it's I think it's great. Um, we at the interest of our time catching up with us here on the podcast interview, let's make sure we cover a little bit of what you wanted to say about um, eating well. Um, you know, there's, that's, that can be a generalized topic. Everybody's got different versions of that, but I think there's some universal truths to that. And then also rest and sleep. How important are these things and what do you want to say about them? Yeah, very, very much. I mean, th these are very important factors. Um, but I do like to say that your training drives your diet, right? So like the training is the stimulus and the diet is part of your recovery, right? So if mm -hmm. you have no training, then I, I don't think it's worth going crazy with your diet because you don't have the stimulus to adapt in the first place. So they, they work hand in hand, right? Um, but that said, um, when, you, when you're eating, basically you want to eat, very simply, you want to eat a lot of protein, you want to eat a moderate amount of carbs, and you want to eat a low to moderate amount of fat, right? And these, these three things are what we would call our macronutrients, so like if you pop open that box of cereal, it's got a label on the, on the edge of it and the label will say like protein, you know, four grams, uh, carbohydrates, 26 grams per serving. Uh, it'll say, you know, total fat, you know, three grams per serving or whatever. And these macronutrients are sort of the basic building blocks of a diet, right? There's more to it than that, but that's the, those are the, that's the major kind of components of what we eat are protein, fat, and carbs. Mm -hmm. And we need all of these things, right? You know, it depends on what's in fashion, you know, any given decade. But, every, you know, it seems like there's always one of these macronutrients is being demonized and one of them's being sort of, <laughs> you know, glorified. Mm -hmm. And right now we're in the, we're in the, the fad of, of keto, right? right. And, and I know I, I just made some people mad because I called it a fad. It's, I'm not saying that keto is not worth doing or that it doesn't have benefits. Yes, it does. That's that's kind of beside the point. When the shirt when the word shows up on the other side of the glass of the refrigerated section of the grocery store, you know that we're in a trend. Yeah, exactly. You know, there was a time I, I grew up with the food pyramid, and it was all about fat. Fat was the enemy. Right. Right. You know, and now we've kind of flipped full circle. But the the point is, we need all of these macronutrients to function and to rebuild our bodies from the stress that we're delivering when we work out. Protein is probably the most important from a fitness standpoint because that's what your body uses to repair cell tissues, to repair muscle mass um, that, that you're using during your workouts, and also to build new muscle mass. And one of the things that, that is really cool about high-intensity interval training, and even more so about strength training, is that when you do these workouts, it triggers all of these processes in your body. Um, you, you know, you release more testosterone when yeah. you do heavy strength work. Um, you, you release more growth hormone, insulin growth factor. And all of these things are basically like, they're messengers that tell your body like, okay, let's go, let's build some more tissue because this, this fool has me, <laughs> you know, training hard <laughs> in the gym. It's like, we're like, we gotta, we gotta do something to handle this, right? Yeah. So your tissues need to rebuild and then build uh, and then add additional mass on top of that in order to um to to make you uh, adapt. So protein is your building block. Um, if you are actually strength training, um, I say most men need 150 grams to 200 grams of protein per day. That's just a very general number. Um, individual needs will vary, but that's. If you are actually doing some, some hard strength training, that's probably what you need. If you're not doing strength training, but you're doing kind of some, some of these basic conditioning workouts, um, then you probably need a little bit lower amount, but 150 grams is a, is a good amount. And so, and it's so conditioning is the Tabata kind of stuff. Strength training is the weights. That's right. That would be yeah. lifting compound lifts, squats, presses, deadlifts, where you're trying to add weight to the bar regularly every workout. That would be, that, that's true strength training. Um, but you know, so 150 to 200 grams, if you're, if you're male for females, it's going to be more of hundred to 150 grams is a good range. And that's probably a lot more than you're used to eating. If you haven't ever tracked this before. <laughs> 
Do you feel like the time you've spent watching YouTube videos, trying out mix tricks, and tweaking version after version of your mixes has not gotten you anywhere? Have you been looking for a simple or straightforward step-by-step -step process for creating a pro mix that won't take years to learn? What if you could learn that process from a Grammy-winning mix engineer who understood all your mixing struggles and could coach you through them? If you struggle with any of these questions, then the Ultimate Mixing Masterclass is for you. Now you can discover a proven step-by-step -step mix system from Grammy-winning mixer Craig Alvin for consistently creating a pro-quality mix from your home studio that will sound amazing everywhere. Here's a quote from one of the students. Absolutely the most informative and helpful block of information mentoring on the mix process I've ever been a part of. This was like sitting behind a mix engineer for years, watching and picking up tips along the way, condensed into a six to seven hour session. Look, when you're ready to take your mixes to Grammy winning quality, then go to ultimatemixingmasterclass.com and go check out Craig's ultimate snare mixing trick now for free. Right, so I, I personally am eating vegan now, so I'm thinking about things like protein in terms of, you know, beans, uh -huh. um, more beans and more beans. <laughs> I'm not sure <laughs> yeah. what else. Uh, lentils, um, yeah, lentils, tofu. Uh, tofu. Yeah, there's certain um, uh, 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 wheat proteins and stuff that you can find as well. Yeah, I've got protein powders like the pea protein. Not, oh, yeah. Not, not the pea that you, comes out of you, but PEA, <laughs> Rockstars. But, um, you know, there's, there's you know, um, vegan ones and stuff. So what... Right. When we think about how much is 150 to 200 of a protein, if it was vegan or vegetable, for example, or plant-based, what might that look like? Can you visualize sure. that at all or am I putting you on the spot? Yeah, no, not at all. So, um, you know, eating habits are, are so individual because we all have different cultures that we grew up in and, you know, there's, there's lots of ways to get to the number. So I'll just draw up a few examples, but it, there's so many ways to do it. Um, for me, I like to eat in the, in the mornings a bowl of oatmeal. And in my oatmeal, oats don't have a lot of protein on their own. They have a little bit. Um, but I will generally put a scoop of um, whey protein powder in there. I'll, I'll put a scoop mm -hmm. of un, unflavored whey protein in there. And that scoop has 25 grams of protein in it. And I'll mix it in there with some fruit and some berries, make it taste good. And, uh, and th so there we go. There's 25 grams in the morning. Sometimes I'll have a couple eggs on top of that. Eggs are high in protein. Um, you might have some, there are some breakfast meats like, uh, like fried ham or something that you can do sometimes. Probably don't want to do a lot of that because it tends to be very high in fat also. But um, there's, some, there's some high protein uh, things you can eat. Of course, for lunch and dinner, um, chicken, beef, pork, um, all the, the sort of typical meats are high in proteins. And so like a fist size portion is probably going to get you somewhere on the order of 30 to 40 grams of, of protein. You know, so if you eat a fist size portion of chicken or beef, that's probably pretty close to 30 or 40 grams of protein. You can look up the actual numbers pretty easily on the internet. Okay. So in that, um, in that example, you're talking about that a, three, a few times a day. A few times a day. And then generally, if you're going to get to 150 plus grams, um, then, or, or if you're female, if you're trying to get to 100 to 150, um, then you probably have to supplement a little bit beyond that. And that's where high protein snacks can come into play. So um, nothing wrong with drinking a protein shake. I prefer whey protein because it's easily digestible and it's very high. You, you can, you, it's very bioavailable. You can use all of the protein that you um, that you consume with that. But there's lots of other types of protein powders out there. There's egg white protein. Um, if, you do, if you're sensitive to dairy, there are, of course, a lot of plant-based proteins. They're not as bioavailable. So if you, if you drink like pea protein, uh, brown rice, or hemp protein, you probably want to do a little bit more than the scoop on the bag says because you're not going to digest as much of that um, of the protein that's uh, that's on the number on the bag. Okay, so and the nice thing about doing the powdered stuff um, is that you can read the back of it and just see how many grams is in a scoop. It's a little easier. That's to, right. To calculate um, because you won't have the fist size version of it. Um, that's right. Yeah. I will. Uh, we don't have to 
we don't have to get, you know, this isn't specifically a vegan podcast. My girlfriend's actually starting a vegan podcast, but I will say this because I feel like compelled to say it, rock stars. There, there is a book that I read this summer called The uh, China Study, written by T. Colin Campbell, and it is it's worth checking out, and it really does make a compelling case for um, why eating a plant based diet ultimately, in the long run, is is uh, may give you an advantage in terms of things like cancer. So that to me is something that I'm really focusing on. But um, but sure. the, I think the important takeaway here too is the understanding that whatever you're choosing to eat, it's getting in that 150 to 200 grams. And I think part of that takeaway is is realizing it's a little more than you think it is. That's right. And so here's here's what happens in practice, right? So we're, we're just talking about macronutrients, right? We haven't really talked about the other aspects of diet, which are, you know, sort of other health health outcomes. You know, I don't want people getting their protein by pounding, you know, bacon all the time. <laughs> Yeah. Right. That's that's not good. That has that has some other problems with it. So in general, if you you know if you're if you're a meat eater, then then I'm I'm thinking mostly, um, you know, lean cuts of meat. That's going to be like you know chicken breasts and you know chicken thighs. If you like dark meat, that's fine too. Um, that's ground beef. Um, that's that's uh, pork like pork chops or you know there's all sorts of ways to to dress those cuts up. Um, I'm not talking about eating like super. Uh, rich meats all the time or, or very heavy, um, very fatty meats all the time. Um, th- those are uh, those are sometimes foods, not not always foods. Um, but yeah, when we talk about macros, when you when you start to eat a lot of protein, it, it actually kind of helps to settle everything else in the diet because the first thing you're going to notice is you're, you're freaking full. <laughs> the protein yeah. is very high in satiety, right? Mm-hmm. It, it keeps you full for for the longest amount of time. Fat is the other thing that is high in satiety. It will keep you full for long periods of time. That's why people that do intermittent fasting um, tend to like fat in their coffee and stuff is because it can help them fast for long periods of time without right. taking in a lot of calories. But um, but when you start eating a lot more protein, you're going to get full. And what happens is that you have less room in your diet to, to start eating junk because you're just full from the protein. <laughs> And so what else are you going to be eating to get your carbohydrates and your fats? Well, for your carbohydrate sources, I like lots of whole foods. So, you know, anything that has one ingredient is probably a good pick. Like fruit. Um, Yeah, fruit. Apples. Fruit's great. Apples, bananas, like whatever you like. You know, don't don't get too hung up on like, well, what about this fruit or that one? Or like bananas have a lot of sugar in them. But just pick stuff that you enjoy eating first. Right, and you, th- that's those would be simple carbohydrates, simple sugars. Pick apples. You could also rock stars, eat, pick apples. <laughs> yeah, apples are great, especially <laughs> I, this time of year. I eat so many apples; it's ridiculous. Yeah, my, my wife actually just made a bunch of uh, apple butter from scratch. <gasps> oh, so good! I've been mixing that in with my oatmeal. Um, nice, it's great. It's nice. like a super, super not, like good tasting applesauce. But um, yeah, and so so basically, if you start eating, you know, uh, sweet potatoes, rice. Um, you start eating starchy vegetables, lots of greens and, and squash. You know, this is fall. So the, when we're recording this right now, so lots of um, squash and zucchini and, and, and uh, starchy vegetables, those are great carbohydrate sources. And again, if you eat a lot of those two things, like high protein and, and high fiber fruits and vegetables, then you're probably going to be pretty full from that. And you've had a really nice, you know, blend of, protein and carbohydrates right there. Now, do you have to go really seeking out the fat or do you find that that sort of makes its way into most things without too yeah, much trying? Exactly. Yeah. So for most people, you're probably going to eat plenty of fat without trying. So fat is, is we get that from oils. Um, it's found in uh, meats. Meats have um, various amounts of fat in them. Beef tends to be fattier, um, especially, you know, ground beef or, or certain cuts of beef that are that are fattier than others. Um, chicken will be leaner, you know, pork somewhere in between usually. Um, or it can come from dairy. You know, dairy tends to have a lot of fat in it, depending on how it's filtered or cultured. I'm gonna but, I'm gonna throw in the the vegan option. So avocado, I think is yes, a great source yep. of, of uh, healthy fat. Probably one of the best in terms of um, the plant based and then and then also um, nuts. Yes. Yeah. Nuts are, are a good source of fats too. But the thing is like, 
if you're making a, a delicious meal, right, you're probably, you know, like let's say you make a salad. Like, you know, a lot of us will throw a little bit of, a little bit of nuts in there maybe to give it some crunch or maybe you put a little bit of, you scrape a little bit of cheese on there to give it some, some tanginess, right? Well, you're going to get some fat in that. Um, if you're a meat eater, you're going to get a lot of fat from your meats. Yeah. Um, you're going to be cooking with oils probably, whether they're vegetable oils or, or whatever. Um, and that is all fat. And most of the time I find that people that, that need to, that, that want to change their body composition, they want to lose body fat. The big, the big trip or tripping point in their diet is they're eating way too much fat. And, and, um, you know, without going down the <laughs> rabbit hole there, the simple thing is that when you look at the calories of these macronutrients, um, protein and carbs, one gram of those is four calories. So one gram of protein, four calories. One gram of carb, four calories. One gram of fat, though, do you know how many, how many it is? Whoops. Lidge, you still there? Sorry, oh, my, 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 my mute button didn't unmute when I was answering your oh, question. No. <laughs> Sorry about that. I was guessing 100 calories. Oh, not, not quite that high. It's, it's one gram of fat is nine calories. Nice. All right. But, but you can see there that it's, it's more than double the calories per gram than protein and carbs. So, you know, fat, it's easy to eat a whole lot of it in a very small amount of food. So, okay. um, right like for instance, I always like to tell people like uh, one tablespoon of olive oil is, um, just looked it up. It's that's like all you need. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It's 120 calories and 14 grams of fat. Yeah, yeah. So that's quite a lot. And you're probably cooking very with cool. more than one tablespoon. <laughs> well, very cool, man. Well, thanks so, for breaking yeah. down some of the stuff that's important for us for diet. Um, we yeah. have we have basically come to the end of our time, but if you were gonna give us a quick answer on sleep, um, should we just be trying to get in eight hours every night? Is that a pretty good way to round it out? Yes. Rest. Yes. Um, which, you know, is not always going to happen, but, uh, I, all I'll say to, all I'll add to that is naps. You know, if you can take a nap, right, right. naps can, naps are great too. They're not going to fix, you can't fix getting no sleep at night with naps, but they certainly can help. Yeah. Especially any uh, new parents out there. You'll fully appreciate that. Yeah. The power of the nap. Well, um, dude, this has been a blast, man. Thanks for coming on the show and talking to us about making great podcasts and music recordings to accompany that, uh, talking about all the things that make a great sound of a voice on a microphone. I think that's pretty dang important to us, whether we're doing podcast music, audiobooks, or whatever. And then um, also, thank you for sharing all these great insights into our health. I think it's awesome. Uh, Rockstars, we'll have a link below for the the 20 workouts download so that you can go get that. Just check it out in the show notes. Um, and there's a link to a Spotify playlist of the many podcasts that Trent has worked on in the show notes as well. So do check that out so you can go listen to what this stuff sounds like because it sounds great. Let me go right to our closing question, if you don't mind, Trent. All right. We're going to take the Wayback Studio machine and you get to go back in time and find young, skinny Trent who <laughs> wants to be a rock star. And you say, listen, dude, um, here I've come back to give you this one bit of advice. Here's the single most important thing that you need to know to be a rock star of the recording studio yourself one day. What advice would you go back and tell yourself if you could? Success is hidden in your daily habits. Nice. And then your young self is like, is that it? <laughs> no, that's, that's very succinct. I love it, man. Yeah. Um, I think, I think that's a hundred percent true. It's like, it's not that thing you did last Friday night. It's what are you doing every night? What are you doing yeah. every day? Yeah, that's right. You know, people that, that, uh, become overweight, um, it doesn't happen overnight. It happened as a succession of the things that you're eating and doing every day or doing or not doing every day. Right. So, so the way to, to reverse that is the, is the alternate, right? It's, it's by bringing a little bit of intention to what you eat every day and, and bringing some attention to how you're training your body and using it every day. Yeah, I like that. It's like if you have found yourself overweight and unfit um, and it happened over time, uh, just be 
aware that it can unhappen over time. Don't, that's don't right. feel like you're stuck there. And it's going to it's going to take some time, but that's okay, right? We're we're we're, we're focused on the process, not the end result. The end result will come if we focus on the process. Yes. And and I don't mean to sound, when I say that, um, you know, if you find yourself there, I don't mean that as a you statement, rock stars. I find myself there at different times. I'm like, yes, man, Liz, yeah. you really let yourself go here or there or whatever. And my takeaway is to remind myself, it's all right. Just, just get yep. back into my routine. Don't sweat it too much. If I don't have, if I can't really kick ass with the workout today, I'll give myself... Uh, I'll just do something that's kind of, you know, better than nothing. And tomorrow right. I'll kick a little bit more ass than that. And it, and it always works. You just got to give it a little, a little bit of patience and st stick to itiveness. Yeah, that's right. I've, I've rebuilt myself many times, many times, you know, it's, uh, especially in building my little audio business. Uh, there were many months that went by where I really didn't do a whole lot physically. And so I had to rebuild. I had to kind of take a bunch of steps back, but it's okay. You know, it's, once you make, once it becomes a lifestyle for you, then you'll you'll worry less about sort of where you are, and and like I said, you'll you'll be more engaged with just doing the process. Nice, awesome, dude. Well, thank you for being on Recording Studio Rockstars with us. Um, I don't think I mentioned this on the show. I did it just before, but Rockstars, when Trent came up to Nashville and we had a visit before this, he brought a delicious pound of coffee for the studio. So thank you for that, Trent. Much appreciated. Let the rock stars know where they can go find you online. Where should they go check out your work other than just clicking through in the show notes? And what if they're ready to make their next hit podcast with you or their next cool record, or they just need some killer music, or they need training so they can get healthy and have a long life in the studio? All right. Well, yeah, you can go to my website, www.marmaladecream.com. And you can see all of the services that I offer there and you can get in touch with me if you want to work on a podcast. And you can send me, if you want to talk about uh, training, you can send me a note through that website as well. You can also find me, if you do the Instagrams, you can find me at marmalade underscore cream. Uh, and you'll see I've got a whole bunch of posts of me lifting weights and working out and also hammering stuff in the studio. Awesome, dude. And I think by the time this comes out, you may have some, uh, we can, we don't have to put ourselves on the spot for any particular date, but you may have some good training and coursework out on both podcast creation and then you are available for actual training, whether it's a one-on-one -on -one or, or group stuff in person and over the internet. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, that's right. So I am, yeah, by the time this comes out, I'll have a podcast course um, up and running. So I, I basically am designing a course for people that want to learn how to podcast at a very detailed level uh, from soup to nuts. So we'll go through the recording process, the editing, the mixing process. We'll talk about all those little tips at the, that we talked about the the top of the podcast. Um, I go into those in a lot more detail as well. So you'll be able to find that at the website. Just go over to marmaladecream.com. And uh, same thing, if you want to contact me because you're interested in training, you can go to marmaladecream.com. Um, occasionally, I also do uh, workout camps, like training camps that are focused on strength training. Cool. And uh, those I, I you can find on startingstrength.com as well as a whole bunch of other cool resources if you're interested in barbell training. Awesome. And, I'm uh, there, man. I'm coming to one of those. Yeah. Tell you what, Lidge, um, I know a lot, of, uh, a lot of folks are up in Nashville. So if you want to get a workshop together, if you want to get a few people together, you know, maybe email the show. And uh, I'll make it happen. We'll put together a workshop in Nashville. Okay, great. Yeah, Rockstars, if you just even drop a comment in wherever you're listening to this, let us know and I'll, I'll look at look for that and keep an eye out for it. Or drop me an email, lidge at recordingstudiorockstars.com. And um, that would be super fun to put something together. Trent, thanks so much for being here with us. I look forward to seeing you in person again and uh, heavy lifting. Yeah, thanks so much, Lidge. <laughs> it's been a pleasure. All right, man. Cheers. Cheers. Thanks so much for listening to Recording Studio Rockstars. If you enjoyed the show and want to help make it better, then please share this episode with your friends on social media and leave a rating and review on iTunes to help the podcast reach more rock stars like yourself. You can click directly over to iTunes or go to rsrockstars.com slash review for an easy explanation. And remember to hit the subscribe button to keep up with weekly episodes. And if you're ready to make your best record ever now, then head over to Recording Studio Rockstars Academy, where you can start with my 
my free course at mixmasterbundle.com. And if you want more free content from recording studio rock stars, all you have to do is go to rsrockstars.com slash email. Again, that's rsrockstars.com slash email to enter your name and email, and I'll keep you in the loop with articles, videos, podcast updates, and even free gear giveaways for your studio. Just look for the link in the show notes below. Thanks so much for listening, and thanks for being a rock star. I'm Lyd Shaw, and this is Recording Studio Rockstars. Now, go make great music. Recording Studio Rockstars would like to give a big thank you to our amazing sponsors who helped make this episode possible. API, OWC, Spectra 1964, Sampley, Sonarworks, and Isotope. Remember to use the coupon codes ROCK10 at isotope.com slash rockstars for 10% off any plugin purchase or start your extended 30-day free trial subscription to get access to lots of their plugins. And sign up for your free account with two projects now at sampley.app or use the coupon code RSR20 to get 20% off the first three months. And don't forget to use the coupon code ROCKSTAR for 10% off any course at Recording Studio Rockstars Academy for a limited time. You'll find links to all these wonderful sponsors in the description of the podcast. These are all things I highly recommend for your studio. They're going to help you make your best record ever. I would also like to give a big thank you to our fantastic team here at Recording Studio Rockstars, Vlad Wesselchenko, Braden Streming, and John Richardson for additional podcast and video production. Thanks, guys. And thanks so much for listening, Rockstars. We'll see you in the next episode. Cheers.